Hey everyone, it's Kick for Sale here, and I'm just going to make this quick announcement about what's going on with The Sugar Coat. So we have this podcast that's now titled The Sugar Coat Podcast. That's the podcast that will be on this channel. And then we have The Sugar Coat Video Breakdowns, which is like my FMA and Code Geass video. I had originally planned for The Sugar Coat to just be like a overall series of essay style like videos of breaking down new content that I can soon this year um but with the amount of time it takes to film edit and just the copyright issues we've been having with fma and code Geass, there probably won't be as many video breakdowns unfortunately i still plan on making video breakdowns but some of our analysis of content that we consume for the first time this year or new content that came out this year such as like marvel movies or something like that will probably be now in a podcast format so yeah that's just an update to let you know what's going on anyway enjoy this episode about a series that is near and dear to my friend's hearts that we just finished reading called berserk hey fellas huh? you know what we're here to do huh we're gonna talk about berserk oh no way oh, no. no way oh no fucking way. We're going to talk about fucking Berserk, which is a manga that we read. All right. And it was good. So we're going to let our residential expert, the one who read it first, and the one who endlessly berated us to read it, uh, Sir Maddox, take, it, right. take over. What can you tell All us right. about the history of Berserk? Okay, so... Berserk is a manga series that was started in 1989 and has been running ever since with the latest chapter coming out, I want to say, September back in 10th. August. September? Yes. All right. September of this year. So, well, at least it's for, been going, for us, it did. Yeah. It's been going for quite a while. Um, there are currently over 364 chapters in the manga, and it was written by the late Kentaro Miura. Bless his soul. He is yes. going down as one of the greatest manga artists and manga writers to ever exist. Rest in peace. Rest in peace, yes. Um, he passed away earlier in May uh, from uh, Araric dis Dissection, I believe is what it was. Uh, so basically it was a heart problem. Um, and had he been suffering from it for a while, or was it like an instantaneous thing that no I one could have I want to say it was like an almost instantaneous thing. Mm. He could it have was, been. He's, he was very private about his life. Yeah, he, he, ver he very well could have been. Um, but from word of mouth from his colleagues and the people that he worked with uh, and the people that he trained, he was known to be a very healthy guy um at least to the public eye so he very well could have been struggling um in his private life but at least to the people that he worked with he was a very healthy person so uh general consensus of berserk is you follow guts on this heart-wrenching and brutal journey uh through the world of midland brutal is an he... understatement yeah uh, he is his ultimate goal is to seek revenge on this guy named Griffith, who is a member of an elite uh, group of archdemons called the God Hand. Um, you follow th him through all these different scenarios where he's building a relationship with others. He slays demons left and right. He he'll sacrifice his morals just to get things done. And he'll also battle his innermost demons just to get some sleep. It's it's really taken a lot from other series and crafted it into his own and has also started um, a lot of tropes that you see in nowadays in a lot of media. Um, and uh, you'll witness quite a lot of things throughout the series like uh camaraderie friendship betrayal revenge um morality and like what's right and what's wrong uh you'll experience a lot of love and heartbreak 
you'll you'll experience a roller coaster of emotions through reading it and i could go on for another five ten minutes about everything you could experience in the book or in the story as a whole it is so good and i highly recommend it um if you're not the biggest fan of reading i know 364 chapters sounds like a lot it while it is it's still worth your time um but if you feel like that's not something you're interested in there are other means um there's an anime that came out in 1997 uh um that covers the first i'd say like the first fourth of the story um the golden age arc um it's around 25 chapters i want or 25 episodes i want to say um and it's a really good adaptation of the golden age arc you have the 2012 2013 movies um there's three of them they also uh cover the golden age arc those are if you're looking for something a bit more modern looking um uh, and you don't really want to go back to the 90s style. And then there's, sadly, the 2016-2017 anime adaptation, which I would just flat out say is not worth your time. The animation and art style is horrendous. The sound design is atrocious. Clang. The, the, yeah, <laughs> the clang. Um, the way the story is written out is all over the place. There's no fluidity the the characters are introduced at the wrong times and fucks up the entire story um i didn't even know that one holy things, shit certain plot points just don't add up it's awful and i i feel really sorry for anyone who had to go through and watch it because <laughs> i know it just it wasted their time and their ears um so that's for that's all for anime adaptations and then for games there were three games that were released surprisingly. You have one that came out in the Dreamcast for uh, in 1999 called uh, Sword of the Berserk: Guts' is Rage. It's its own small story in between volumes 22 and 23. It is not canon to the story due to uh, certain time points being misaligned and things just not adding up properly. And it's like a hack and slash type game. Uh, you have a Japanese exclusive PS2 game that came out in 2004 uh, called Berserk Millennium Empire Arc Chapter of the Holy Demon War. I know it's a mouthful. Um, it covers a bigger section of the story from volumes 22 to 27. It is also a hack and slash. Um, the only way to play it in English is through a fan translation, which you can most likely emulate. Um, or if you really want to go out of your way, there is a way to apply an English patch on a physical Japanese version, but that is way out of the realm of my expertise, and I'm sure you could find plenty of tutorials on how to do that online. Then there's the 2016 game that came out for PC, PS4, PS5, uh, PS3, PS4, and PS Vita um, called Berserk and the Band of the Hawk. It covers everything from the Golden Age to the Millennium Empire arcs, so around chapters like one all the way up to like late 200s almost 300s um and is a muzo slash warriors type game if you've ever seen games like dynasty warriors or hyrule warriors on the nintendo switch it's like those games where you basically just button mash and kill a bunch of troops and occasionally have like a boss fight um that's pretty much all the adaptations for the series. If I had to give you recommendations, I would say read the read the manga, like flat out, just read the manga. If you want the full true experience, that's the only way you're getting it. No beating around the bush. It's just you have to read. If you are just wanting to get into the series to see what it's about, if you can deal with the 90s style, go with the 90s anime. It's really good. The the soundtrack for it is amazing. Um, where Guts theme come from? That is true. That's where the Guts theme comes from. Pretty I'm sure for everyone's heard. Yes. I'm forgetting the composer's name, but bless his heart. He is so good. He has also done music for other pieces of Berserk Media. Um, but I would say it's a good starting point if you're just looking to get into it, but don't want to read the manga. 
If you're looking for something a bit more modern and not as much time consuming, the 2012-2013 movies are where you get it. Um, They can be found on Netflix, and they're honestly really good adaptations of the Golden Age. And you can't go wrong with that if you don't want to go back to the 90s stuff. And then if you want to play any of the games, I would say 2016, uh, Band of the Hawk is the way to go. Do Just due to how accessible it is and how much story it covers. If you want something a little bit out of the norm, play the PS2 game if you can. Uh, just due to how the game is handled and how the story is handled. It's a really good experience. I've been playing through it recently, and it's been a blast. Um, so I can't really recommend the Dreamcast game, mainly just because I haven't played it, but from what I've heard, it's very clunky and isn't the best time. And then, obviously, I've already explained why the 2016-2017 anime is bad. Um, so that's the general consensus of Berserk. It's a beautiful story with gorgeous artwork. The characters are flawed yet they feel structural and sound and they feel like real people you know and i've grown attached to these characters over the course of almost two years at this point um and even though i came into the series pretty late in like late 2019 um i've known about the series for a while and it has been one of those things that have changed my outlook on life, quite literally. I would say it has changed me for the better. And if I had this series a few years ago, back when I was in a darker place, I, no joke, would think that it would have saved me. It is, I have grown so attached to these characters and this story as a whole and the things that it has taught me. And it, it is 100% worth your time if you're even the slightest bit interested. I can guarantee you, if you can get past all of the vulgarness, all of the gr- grotesque, and like just gross shit that's in it, you will find a well-crafted, beautiful story that has a message for everyone who reads it. Um, so that, that's my take on it. Damn, what, this, what do you, this what do guy you lads think? really just, he just dove right in. And you know what? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately just jumping straight into the, the deepness of it. But hey, it is, it is berserk. It's deep, I'm, it's brutal, yeah. moving. I think we can all agree that Guts is probably and will go down as one of the greatest characters Probably in media history. Oh, 100%. Probably the most human, relatable... Well, maybe not necessarily relatable, but definitely the most human protagonist mm-hmm. I've ever, like, read or watched. Just in any form of media. He's the most human person in media. In my humble opinion. We will go further into that when we reach uh, spoiler territories. So I guess I will just go. So obviously, Maddox was the first of the three of us, and then he would not shut up. But <laughs> hey, guys, you know that Dark Souls was a Berserk reference? You know what Berserk is, right? You should read this series called Berserk. It's amazing. And this would happen... Uh, I want to say uh, every, like, 60 seconds, every minute, <laughs> it would just be like, hey, guys, do you know what Berserk is? Motherfucker would not shut up. So you know what we did? We read it. We killed him. Uh, we read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 we did, yeah, we did that. But, uh, but damn, am I, am I glad I read it? Holy shit. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just go to next. Uh, so I read it after (laughs) these two did. Uh, I, uh, what's today? Today is Saturday. I finished it on Wednesday. 
So I literally just finished it like a couple days ago. And I started, I think, like right before 364 came out. And uh, I read it in a month and a half. And it's it's been a long time since I've been invested in it, like a reading. So uh, I hate reading personally. I've always struggled with reading. I don't enjoy it. I struggle focusing when I read. Um, so tackling Berserk was a bit overwhelming at first because of just how long it was with all its chapters and stuff. I was like, this is, this is going to take me a while. Um, but at, you know, at some point I just, I just had to, I just had to start doing it and then I did. And it just, it just spiraled out of control from there just because of how, how, freaking great the story is i just didn't want to stop reading at some points i would like stay up um at during school nights because i'd be like well i mean it only take it only, it would only take me like an hour to read a volume on average so i'd just be like eh, i'll gain an hour of sleep later i can read another book <laughs> so I'd, i would just do that and uh it was it was freaking great it's been a long time since I have really enjoyed reading something. So I'm really I'm really happy that I I pushed myself to read Berserk cuz I had I had thought about doing it for a while like over the summer and I just didn't do it. And then and then I finally did and I am glad I did. So that's that's it from from like a personal standpoint on like how it's challenged my reading skills the story and characters and shit like that itself um i could pretty much say exactly what what maddox said i have only read the manga i'm getting ready to play the band of the hawk game because i bought it on steam um probably make a video on that so stick around for that video maybe coming out soon um and then I would like to watch the 90s animes and the movies at some points. And everyone knows how bad 2016, 2017 is. And I don't ever yeah. want to watch it. I don't ever want to curse myself with that. So, but yeah. And then we'll dive further into the story as we go on. But before we do that, Noah, do you have anything you would like to share about your introduction to Berserk and your uh, general thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, look, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I can't read. So when he was like <laughs> pressuring me and like he's like, dude, you gotta read this. This is the greatest, <laughs> was... greatest story you'll ever experience. I was sitting there at night, like looking at the pictures, making up the story as I go. So basically <laughs> my berserk experience went like this. The the tall guy with the big sword, uh, his name is Guillermo, and he was a disowned <laughs> pizza pizzeria man. Uh and uh, the 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 uh, white haired guy, his name is um, Greg Hefley, and he made the greatest <laughs> pizza known to mankind during an eclipse, and it was so good that it sent you straight to the afterlife because your life was complete, and it, it's it was like a revenge story of Guillermo going after Greg Hefley for d outdoing him in every way, and as he struggled. And then there was also like some, like cosmic horror. Like Cthulhu showed up at one point, but that that's not important. Um, you know, it, it really changed my outlook on pizza as a whole. You know, I I, I completely get it. <laughs> no, so uh, I mean, do my, we even need to go on berserk. at this point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just rewrite Berserk. I think I can do it better. I'll finish Berserk. I got this I'll guy. Finish it myself. No, so my experience started like other Noah here, uh, where he was like, he kept talking about Berserk, and there were times where I was playing games, and he would start talking about it, and then he would start up a live stream, and I think one of the, one of the standout points that, um, that I really remember is I was playing Halo Combat Evolved. It's an old uh, game. It is an old game. Really good, good game. game. Don't recommend it, though. <laughs> <laughs> <Get> it. <laughs> uh, 
he was looking for a panel, and we were literally joking about this before we started. <laughs> and it, it's it's a panel that includes Skull Knight, and I'll just call him Femto to avoid spoilers. And it was it was him holding up a sword to Femto, and he couldn't find it, but he found like variations of the characters in the same scene. And he was scrolling through, and I was seeing like all the different panels. I'm like, wow, this is really pretty. And he's like, oh yeah. Uh, without getting into spoiler territory, he pulled up a bunch of other other panels. It was like the scale, the detail, and everything. It was so pretty. So then I started reading it uh, back in February, and I would read it like when I go when I went to bed, and I would read like ten over ten chapters a night. Uh. Uh, sometimes I would actually read almost to when I was supposed to get up just because it captivated me that much and it honestly it didn't matter we weren't it was online school we weren't learning anything who gives a so shit I was, who gives I was a able shit to play with it. berserk is more important oh, berserk was absolutely more important. it got to the point where I started reading it during school <laughs> like, like my stats teacher was just going on about like pennies and statistics and like I'm like yep that's great anyways um, but no, the, the story, the story stuck out to be the most, uh, or not the story, I guess, like, the experience of everything that Guts went through, like, struggling so hard, that really stuck out to me, and also just how pretty it was. There's so many, like, there, it's on purpose, but there's also just a couple panels, or not, like, way more than a couple, sorry. Uh, where it's just like cinematic on accident. Mm-hmm. Ooh. And it will probably be one of the greatest pieces of literature I ever read. And I, I, I am not expecting it to be topped at all. And that's about it. That's about it on my end. Nice. Incredible. I agree. I agree with all your points. Yeah, I know you agree. <laughs> so those are our, our very general thoughts, overviews. Um, before we dive in too deep, like if you're, if you like manga and you haven't read this, what are you doing? And then second off, if you really want to read this or like you even have the slightest interest in reading berserk like we're getting in the spoiler so you need to you need to be cautious you don't want to get spoiled you want to you want to sit down and enjoy that reading experience blind like we did pretty much yes, here here's if, if a clear like, division yep if you don't like reading leave a comment <laughs> put your address down in the comments right now. hey it i'm will, just saying i will I will run down to where you are. All right, I will and read it to you. <laughs> yeah, we'll read it we'll to read you. It. You gotta pay us, but we'll read it to you. I'll do. It. No, we I'll... work an hourly fee. I, I, I strongly believe that if you're good at something, you never do it for free. But just this once, <laughs> just for you, I'll do it for free. Oh. I'm incredible. I'm coming voice actor, so I'll, I'll give you. I'll. I will give you each character's voice. I would still say to this day, I don't enjoy reading. Like, I still don't enjoy it, but I had an amazing time reading Berserk. It was great. It's yeah, coming like from someone plans, who doesn't like reading. Because read I'm an intellectual. Okay, Mr. Greg Heffley. It was for a bit. <laughs> sure it was. Yes, if, as, as Noah said, if you have the slightest interest in it, after everything we've said so far, pull the trigger. Either <laughs> if if you it, no shut 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 whoa, 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 whoa. shut up. We're talking about pull the trigger, Berserk, not Persona. Read it. Shut up. <laughs> if you are able to support the series and buy the physical manga, I have been doing that slowly over the course of the past few months. But I sadly do not own all the volumes yet. But I am doing so. Uh, to support the series. If you cannot buy the physical manga, read it online. But if you do decide to read it overall, 
I would highly suggest at least buying a few volumes to support the series and to just show support to it in general. It doesn't have to be the deluxe editions, even though those are fucking cool. It 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 doesn't have to be anything like that. If you can just pick up a few volumes just to have them and say that you've you have them and you've read them, that's good enough. But overall, if you can't read it physically, read it online. Um just make sure you're reading anything and everything Dark Horse. Dark Horse is the official translation for it in English and is the best translation in English. If you're reading anything that refers to Guts as Gatsu or Gats uh, as and Griffith as Griffith Su or Casca as Casca with K's, you're not reading the right thing. You're reading scanlations. Don't read those because those have misinterpretations, uh, usually errors in wording. It's garbage. Read Dark Horse material and Actually, I just thought about it. You can probably find a website that has the Dark Horse comics uh, available online that you can pay for. That will also support the series. So if you can, if you can find a way of reading it without pirating it, please do that. I would highly recommend doing that. The series needs some uh, love. The series does need some love. What he said, you're probably not going to have any luck online finding anything, uh, mainly due to scalpers. Yeah, you can go screw yourself. I know who you are. I'm coming for you. <laughs> um, but a uh, while back, especially like right now, with like we're having problems getting a hold of stuff online. So you're definitely not. You're. I know for a fact you're not going to have any luck online. But if you do, pick us like pick up one copy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or, if you have, like, a, a Barnes & Noble or some bookstore, probably not your local library, I really don't think they're going to be holding something yeah. like that. But if there's, like, a, a, a Barnes & Noble somewhere, their their manga section is, you know, is pretty, it, it's probably, like, a, a medium size. They, I know, when I went, they had, a, like, I want to say it was, like, the entire collection mm -hmm. in the, uh, the thick, the the really the deluxe thick, editions. The deluxe edition, yeah, they had mm -hmm. those, like the entire series, like right there. Yeah. So you'll probably have better luck going out and looking for a physical copy. Um, or if there's like a half price books, maybe someone dropped off a copy there. Yes, it's the, worth a shot, honestly. Yes. Um, from this point forward, there's going to be spoilers involved. You do not. Like, say it's about a lot of different series, but truly, you do not want any of the moments or artwork for this series spoiled for you. Because you need to experience the artwork and beauty that is Berserk firsthand. Facts. Go find it, read it, and then come back and listen to us ramble. Yeah! Because that's Woo! what we do! We don't shut up. All right, time to not shut up for the next, like, certain amount of time. However long this goes, we're just going to keep sure. going. Okay. So, our plan was, after spoiler area, or spoiler free area, to just, I think we're going to go for our favorite characters first, and then we're going to work through the series chronologically. Oh. Um. So, before we dive into favorite characters, shall we expand more ab about the main protagonist of this series? Because he is easily, I think, a favorite character to all of us. Oh, 100%. Why um, is Guts one of the best protagonists, literally, of all time? Arguably the best protagonist of all time. So, I, I'm... I'm going to be greedy, take the floor first. Oh, please um, do. Please um, do. This guy's going to go on for like 10 minutes. I, I have it's a, okay. I have a hard do. time putting things into words, and it's not really my strong suit, but Don't I'm going to try my best do. anyways. Um, so Guts's whole story is one of the most tragic backstories 
for a character that I have ever seen and I will debate will ever exist. He was born from a corpse hung by a tree, picked up by a group of mercenaries, was uh so he doesn't have a he doesn't have parents he has a mother figure and a father figure a mother figure who then dies a few years later and then is basically a not necessarily abused but is picked on by the rest of the group because they think that he is a curse and the reason the woman died is because of guts so already off to a bad start and he's a child well, this is merely we've barely even scratched the tip of the iceberg we're still in the sky right now i'd say right <laughs> so then really young age like six seven years old being forced to fight in wars where everyone's life is on the line and there are constant bodies being thrown everywhere he is forced into the situation and if he doesn't comply he's either going to die by the hand of an enemy or die by his father figure so it's not looking good for him. He eventually trains himself up to try and get into the spotlight of his father figure named Gambino. Um, he is also then relentlessly beaten by Gambino whenever he fucks up because he just sees him more as a as like a weight rather than an asset. So Gambino doesn't think too kindly of Guts, but Guts wants him to think kindly of him. Then we have Donovan. Donovan being a member of the group that Gambino and Guts are in. Donovan then pays Gambino three gold to rape him. At the age of like eight to ten. So, not, not even a teen yet. He has experienced war, hardship, and sexual assault. He then later, the next, literally the next day, kills his assaultant. He he literally kills um, Donovan. So then he has to live with that on his conscience as well. Later, a few years later, in a war, Gambino loses his leg and becomes a drunken bastard. Then one night, gets drunk, goes into Guts's tent, tries to kill him. Guts then kills Gambino essentially now having the conscience of killing his father figure, the person he looked up to on his mind, is then shot by his group because they thought that he just straight up murdered him and has to flee and run out on his own, is then left to die and picked up by another mercenary group in which he basically goes on to be a lone mercenary. So he's this man is not even a teenager yet, and he has already experienced some of the darkest things that can happen to a person and that's like what the first like couple chapters of golden age that is like, within yeah. the first that is within the second half of the prologue chapters and like the first i want to say like 10 to 15 chapters of the golden age of 364 so chapters right so practically everything that i just talked about happens within the first six volumes of 41 which we did not of say 41 yes i forgot to mention that um so yeah he has a pretty rough life after shutting himself off he then basically puts himself into a lone wolf status gets recruited into a group called the band of the hawk after being robbed by said group but then taking out his robbers He's recruited into the group, builds up trust, is then later betrayed by said group and best friend with all of this like other shit happening in between. So he has a lot of relationships that have just been broken. He has a lot of hardship during these times. He's just unstable. After this betrayal and after all of his friends are practically just gone, he then sets out on a revenge quest blinded by rage goes on to kill lots and lots of not only monsters, but people because they're in his way, continues to shut himself down and away from people, 
over the course of the story, eventually slowly opens himself back up and becomes a better person because he's learning through other people. And by inviting more people in, he learns to accept himself and learns to accept others and quickly realizes, I no longer want revenge. Revenge isn't my main priority. My main priority now is to protect the ones I love. And it's just the way he's written, he feels so grounded and rooted in like human emotion and structure. Yet it's like he's wielding a seven foot tall, like 200 to 400 pound sword, something a human can't really do. If you ask me, it's more of like a giant hunk of metal. <laughs> Slab of iron. And he, keep in mind, he's doing this while he's also blind because he's missing an eye, and he's also missing half of an arm. So he really, what he's doing is holding most of that mass with one arm. And he is like peak human. So you think like, oh, that's pretty fictional, you know? You wouldn't really expect much from that. But he is so relatable in the sense that like, he feels like someone that could easily exist in the real world. He feels like a real human being, and you can sense his emotions and the things that he goes through. It's, he's so well-written, and he tries to mask the things that he's insecure about and he tries to do all of these things to make sure people don't know what he's feeling. But at the end of the day, it eventually gets out. And he's just like, I'm sorry. And people are like, we get it. And that's okay. And he just continues struggling on knowing that he is flawed. But at the end of the day, if he's doing what he wants, and he's doing it for the sake of protecting others, then he's happy. And it's over the course of 364 beautiful chapters that honestly, I, I can't put into more words how perfect of a protagonist Guts is. He is the and, epitome of badass, but he's also not like any other badass you've ever seen in media. Exactly. He is my favorite protagonist and probably my favorite character of anything ever and i can safely say he will never be topped by anybody so that is all i really had to say what do you two think about guts after i just rambled on i don't know <laughs> what else i can say because that's pretty much a hundred percent accurate and how i feel about guts like, damn. I mean, it, the, the the entire manga does a really good job at telling what I would call, what I would consider two stories. And it's like the, the story of Guts and then the story of everything that happens around Guts, which gets more fleshed out in uh, the, I want to say it's Falcon of the Millennium arc? Mm-hmm. The, but basically it, the it, latter half of the story yeah he's so, he's a very dynamic character and it's like the first let me look this up so i don't oh, i went too far down clown, okay. clown um yeah look buddy you have seconds to live keep it up I dare you. <laughs> uh so like the the first couple uh the first arc which is like the black swordsman mm-hmm and the prologue chapters, the way Guts is introduced is, and th this also gets fleshed out in later chapters, but he is a character that you are not supposed to like. You're not really supposed to agree with him. And when I first read it, I was like, yeah, I don't like, I don't like Guts. I don't like this character. I, I don't really agree with everything that he does. I mean, like, yeah, he's getting the job done, but they're, 
you could do it a different way without being so reckless and hurting all these people. I agree with that. The first and the over first the time, course of yeah. the story, he changes incredibly to where, like, when you go back and you look at the prologue chapters, and then you look at the character that he is in the like in chapter three sixty four. It is it is a completely different character, like mentally, physically. It's fantastic the way he was written. I was gonna mm-hmm. say the first the first time I read Black Swordsman, like when we read it when we read it together. The first two chapters that we read as a group, we did a we did a group read where we assigned roles to <laughs> to characters, and that was that was a little fun thing. That was technically our first introduction to Berserk. But anyway, when we did that and we read the first two chapters of Black Swordsman, I was like, "Is this the character that Maddox has been like raving about? This guy's kind of mean." Why is he such a hero? Not necessarily a hero, but like, why is he such a renowned character? He seems like a bit of an ass. And he is a first. Yeah. That's that's the beauty of it. He turns into not an ass. And that is the most. Like. Understated way of putting it, he goes from ass to not ass. There's mm-hmm. so much more going on than that. And even in the prologue chapters, you see, like, at the end of one of the fights, you see Guts, like, heartbroken. Like, you you see him in a saddened state. Yeah. And and Puck is just like, that's odd. That's That doesn't really seem like what I've just seen so far. And af- afterwards, you go through Golden Age and you get back up to Conviction after golden age and black swordsman takes place between conviction and uh golden age and so it it goes from like a present time to flashback all the way back up to present time type of deal for the story and once you get back up to that point you you look back on the prologue and you're like yeah okay his actions here make a lot more sense for the state that he is currently in and makes him just that much of a better character because because at first it's just like oh the things he's doing are unjustified and you're you're not supposed to agree with that it's supposed to be like a moral gray area and then you get up to the point through the story where that's supposed to happen but you then have learned of all the shit he's been through and you kind of just sit there and you go you know what even though you were a dick about it i understand and like it it makes sense as to why you're doing things this way now it's still a moral gray area as if it's a good or bad thing or a good or bad thing of way eh, a good or bad way of going about things but it's understandable now and it shows how much a character can change because as as noah said you look at him from the start and then you look at him in the most recent chapters. And even though it's like two completely different character types in the way that he acts, it's like almost two completely different characters. But it's the same character crafted over the course of a story that it it's just beautiful. Well said. 32 years the series has been going on, right? Yes. I believe. Yeah. It's a 32 year long story of a an amazing character, great protagonist. Yes. Shall we move on from guts? Yeah. <laughs> Cuz now now we can go from like of course everyone's favorite character to yes. All right, then who do you like other than guts? <laughs> uh, guts. Wait, <laughs> yeah. shit. Uh, I heard guts. Said that. Uh, I mean guts. I mean guts. guts. I mean guts. Uh, I mean guts. Uh, I mean guts. Uh, <laughs> Quick, name five things that are guts. Uh, uh, Casca, uh, Griffith, uh, uh, guts. Team. <laughs> Obviously, everyone loves guts, but the series has other really great, well-written characters. So why don't we dive yes. in? Uh, Maddox, would you like to start us off again? Sure. Um, I'm probably not going to get too in depth with 
each of these, but I'm going to pick like a top three. Um, I aren't love guts. Ma- <laughs> yeah, there aren't guts. <laughs> uh, even though I love pretty much the entire cast, there's only like two characters I don't really like. Um, that being Mozgus and another character I can't really think of their name. Um, I love pretty much the entire cast, but if I had to pick like the top three that aren't guts, I'd probably have to go with Shirke at the top, and then Casca, and then um, uh, Skull Knight. Uh, reason for and I, I would actually say that's pretty much like in order, top to bottom. So like, if I had to rank them, it would be guts, Shirke, Casca, Skull Knight. Um. Shirake, just because I really like the dynamic between her and Guts and how she sort of leads him on the right path and helps him in times of need when Casca used to do that. Um, and I just, I, I, I don't know, I really like the connection that they have um, with her looking up to him and seeing him as kind of like this per, per, uh, parental figure after the the um the forest mistress uh went away and kind of like sacrificed herself um so now he's kind of like her guardian and they watch each other's backs and it's a really nice dynamic that i i really do enjoy and also her powers are really fucking cool and um like the artwork associated with her magic are some of the best panels in the series in my opinion just because of the the sheer i guess volume of things that are just put into each panel it's really nice um so so shirke's pretty much my number one or yeah my number one and then casca uh just because i I sound like such a fucking simp but like she's (laughs) Like, she's just so fucking well crafted as a character. I say that about everyone, but like it's true. Um, she has this really powerful dynamic of wanting to love guts, but at the same point wanting to risk her life for Griffith during the Golden Age because he gave her a purpose to fight and to live. And you could kind of say that's the same way for guts when he joins the band of the hawk. And so they kind of share a similar experience, yet the way that they feel about Griffith is kind of different um, overall. And the fact that they like hook up and become a couple, it, it's just really nice. The way that they express their feelings to each other is also really nice, both like in private and in public. And in the later chapters, uh, after Casca is brought back from being in her uh, sort of dumb, dumbed down state, uh, her, I guess you could say, post eclipse state, after she's brought back from that, um, it's, it was just so emotionally like tearing to see that she wanted to see him so badly after she basically just, because. Over the course of most of the story, she knew what was going on, but she couldn't do anything. Her body was just kind of in autopilot, and she was just in the back spectating it all. And so the fact that she, while physically didn't show any compassion or appreciation for Guts and what he was doing, he kind of knew deep down inside she was still in there, and she was. And so she wanted to show appreciation at the end but she was then traumatized by everything that she's been through and it all came coming back. And so they couldn't be together and it was so heartbreaking to see and is one of the many times that this series has made me cry. Um, just, I, I love her dynamic with all the other characters. I, w- I love the way she's written. I love how she's just a complete badass and is willing to just take on anyone who who like opposes her 
even if she knows that she's pretty much screwed in the situation she she will fight to the end and i just love i just love everything about her um and then finally for skull knight um there's not really too much to say about skull knight because we don't know much about him but that's also one of the things i love about him is the sheer mystery and while we were given a little bit of like info in some of the more recent chapters and it's kind of hinted towards who he is over the course of the story as you learn through the lore of the land um it still isn't really clear who skull knight is and what his goal ultimately is we know he wants to kill the god hand but we don't know exactly why and the way he helps guts throughout his journey you can kind of see it reminds him of himself and there's something about him that ties the whole thing together and it's all shrouded in mystery and it's so cool um and he he acts as this certain like like guardian figure throughout the series there's like a certain type of way of saying it like there's there's a certain way he is portrayed and it's a certain archetype i can't remember off the top of my head what it is but he's supposed to be like the guardian who helps the hero through the story but he's also involved in the story and you're not really sure how it's all going to fall into place with him there so it's it's great i really like skull knight i really like all the characters but um yeah, top three, Shirke, Casca, Skull Knight. That's all I got to say for now. Oh, uh, who wants to go next? No, would you like to go? Yeah, I can go next. Were you thinking of Helper? Were you thinking of the Hero's Journey? Yeah. Uh, that's I want... in the Hero's Journey. It's called the Helper, the Guide. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, top three in no particular order. Probably Irving the Hunter in the later chapters. Really? Uh, huh. I just think he's a pretty cool character. I like his apostle form too. How mm -hmm. it, uh, he's it, sick. Yeah, where he, he's kind of like uh what do you call those? Like the centaur? Yeah, yeah, centaur. yeah. yeah. Like, he's like a centaur, but his human body sits in the back and he uses ram horns as a bow. It's really cool. Really interesting design. His, his bow is both it's basically like an extension of his body when he's in human form. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it literally fuses with him when he becomes an apostle. And then probably the other apostle, Rakshas. Mm -hmm. Literally the... just because of his design. Yeah. Where it's like the magic carpet that takes the form of a somewhat human looking thing with a mask. Yes. What's the Riles fucking really funny like panel? His, his masks that he gets. The, it's also hilarious. The one where he gets sad. <laughs> oh, my face is gone. I need to go put on a new one. Be right back. Yeah. Um, and then probably... Uh, Serpico? Hmm. And there's really not a reason behind that. I just think he's a cool character as well. Interesting. Well, I guess if I had to put a reason behind it, it's probably the same reason for the Code Geass picks with how loyal he was. Even when his leader decided to basically betray the family name, he still went along with it. Yeah, I can understand that. Mm. I say that a lot, don't I? Yeah. yeah, you should probably stop. It's yeah. kind of embarrassing, dude. Yeah, I'm I probably should. Yeah, I'm pretty cringe. Yeah, I know. Yeah, cringe boy. What are your favorite characters? My favorite characters. Oh boy. Well, my my favorite characters that aren't guts. I'm gonna have to agree with Maddox. My favorite character that isn't guts is Shirke, easily. Damn. What Maddox said something about uh Shirke's like panels especially being really cool. I think personally from my experience 
like all the like panels that really wowed me were panels that had either like guts or on rare occasions skull knight in them like the ones that really hit me and wowed me and I was like that is insane and that mm-hmm. didn't happen with any other character until Shirke came along once Shirke gets introduced the whole story takes like it to the to the next level Shirke yeah. enhances the story so much not not by just introducing you know the magic elements but also enhancing guts himself taking his character to the next level starting his progression to you know well not really starting it but just furthering it more yep she's so cool she's she's adorable watching her like integrate in um in society when she she had known nothing but you know witchcraft and living in the forest her entire life yep i uh, like like maddox said her dynamic with guts i really really was i feel like that was the dynamic besides maybe like okay well i'm invested in all the dynamics that was one of the most compelling and interesting dy- dynamics i was the most invested in in the entire story when those two characters were together i was like fully focused and invested in, and it was like that was that was like the purest berserk for me it was just like when those two characters were together I really, really like Shirke and what Shirke adds to the story. And Shirke has a dynamic with another character that's probably my second favorite character. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but Farnese is my yes, second Farnese. favorite character in Berserk. And while I don't know if that's a popular pick or maybe a hot take or something like that, I genuinely don't know. But... I think Farnese might be like one of my favorite female characters maybe ever in media. I think her development is second to guts in my humble opinion. It was so fascinating seeing her as an antagonist at first with her whole, you know, binded by her religion, and then uh, going along with Guts, getting caught up with Guts, seeing everything that Guts goes through while like she considered him the villain and being utterly floored and then retreating back to what she knew. She was like, nope, nope, nope. How, like, how is this even possible? This guy's this guy's crazy. We gotta, we gotta, like, we gotta capture him. We gotta. She just, she just went back to her old habits. Like my religion is, it's the only way. It's the way I know. It's the way I trust. So she goes back, and then we get further into conviction, where she meets up with guts again, and she sees even more and more and more of just the horrors he goes through every single day, and then. Uh, his name's Moskus, right? Big square dude. Minecraft, yes, Minecraft fucker. Square head. Yeah, Moskus uh, reveals himself to be a demon. And I feel like that's that's the point. And all that stuff and the god hand appearing reincarnation of Griffith that pushed Farnese over the edge and she really reconsidered like everything she ever believed in. And then she was just like, I'm following guts. Yep. I'm following guts. And then she, she committed to it. And throughout the entire journey with guts, she struggles with her, um, her sense of self worth and how she can contribute to the group. She feels worthless. Um, sometimes not realizing that she does have worth in protecting Casca, but sometimes she sees that as just like, that's that's nothing i'm i'm worthless beyond that but eventually that evolves and develops into her realizing that that is important she's greatly helping her friend and guts eventually considers her a really close friend and putting so much trust into her as to entrust probably the most important person in guts's life 
to Farnese while Casca, you know, can't do anything. And then Farnese takes the next step forward, which I didn't even see coming. It kind of shocked me the first time. And I was like, this is going to get interesting when Farnese goes to Shirkan and says, I want to learn witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And then that all develops. And then she picks it up real fast. She doesn't have much self-confidence in it at first. Quickly picks it up and starts wowing everyone around her when they go back to her hometown. And then they meet like family and then Roderick joins and they're like, oh, my God, this is where you've been. This is what you've been doing. Oh, my. Oh, my God. <laughs> How? And uh, I would have. And then she she went to the, the elf. What's it called? Elfhelm? Elfheim. Elfheim. Thank you. And then she's now doing witch classes. And I would have loved to see where, where that had continued to go. And then dynamic between her and Shirke as well. It's just also adorable. And as someone who has struggled with religion in the past, I mentioned that on, uh, I think I messaged it on Full Metal Alchemist video. I want to say, yeah. But also struggling with self-worth and self-confidence and just thinking you're not important really speaks deep, deep levels to me or just like meaning doing something that like is helpful to someone else and they like greatly appreciate it give you a lot of gratitude but like from your point of view it doesn't seem like much or you just think you're doing nothing of value that that was really really touching and that's why i really really love farnese i think she will easily go down as one of my favorite female characters and favorite characters in media really touched me personally so maybe she should be number one instead of Shirake, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, third place, probably Serpico as well. I also really like his loyalty to Farnese more than... I, I, I don't... Um, how do I word this? I think his loyalty to Farnese is the most like compelling loyalty to like a character or something you know you know what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. like yeah, i'm picking up what you're putting down okay that's good that's good <laughs> um the, that especially how they're so close and he'll just basically do anything for her because he wants to see her happy but i also really love every scene with like serpico versus guts and we'll get more into that when we talk about battles we're going to talk about mm -hmm. our favorite battles later on. But when Serpico first fought Guts on that really narrow cliff, oh my god, I was like, dang, this guy's cool. And then he got the wind thing and the wind sword. And <laughs> oh my god, Serpico, like, he, I was like, oh my god, he's like the second coolest character now, easily. <laughs> Fucking amazing. I love Serpico. If I had to say an honorable mention, I this might be kind of cheating, but he he's really close, and I want to mention it because he really grew on me. I did not like him at first, but he kind of grew on me a lot. Is uh, Isidro. I did not like... <laughs> Isidro. I did, yep, I did not like him. I really didn't. But I don't think it was until, like, after Shirke got introduced and we got further into, like, the end of millennium falcon and the intro of fantasia that yep. i really started to understand isidro's role in the story and why i like him i think at least from my point of view i don't know if this is intentional or not but it's art art's open to interpretation it kind of can be seen as like isidro mirrors guts as a kid and guts as gambino but instead guts now with his past experience can can be be the better father figure he never had he had someone to look up to as a kid but they were never really a good father figure to him so now yeah. guts has that chance to give this give this kid what he never had and isidro really looks up to guts probably more than any other character so <laughs> 
that that was that was really nice and i'm i'm glad i got to like him over time so yeah those are my personal favorite characters shirke fernie serpico honorable mention isitra nice basically guts's main party yeah yeah anytime his main like i like the other stuff in berserk whenever they would cut away from the main group it was good it was good stuff but every t- I was just, whenever they cut back to the main group, I was like, "Yes, yes, <laughs> time to time to get back into the the real shit." That was what I was most invested in. It was it was so good, like amazing group dynamic, amazing characters. I love them, love them so much. Very nice. Good discussion, fellas. So now. Shall we move into perhaps talking about the art and fights um, from a chronological standpoint? We'll just do. Do we want to just... do fights or do we want to do panels or I chapters see... or what do what do we want to do? I was thinking we kind of just go through chronologically if you would want to. So like, say we enter Black Swordsman or like. Millennium Falcon arc or Conviction, and then you bring up this is a panel I really like in that. This is a fight I really like in that. Okay. This is a chapter yeah. I really like in that. You know what I mean? So just yeah, just go chronological. And so then as just we go, go. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Why not? So why don't we? Why don't we start just at the very beginning? It makes sense. Uh, the prologues, Black Swordsman. Any thoughts on what happens in this? Um. To be completely honest, I didn't really pull much, or if anything, from the from the prologues or Black Swordsman arc. Mainly just because I lumped it in with my stuff in the Conviction arc. Um, but if I did have to pick something from from Conviction or from from Black Swordsman, I'd probably say, um, out of everything, my favorite fight would probably be against the um against the snake <laughs> um <laughs> we have an experience with that fight so yeah um Shout out mainly to our buddy just sam it, but you're still burned <laughs> <laughs> uh mainly just cuz like it just kind of showed how brutal guts can be at times yeah. um it's the intro it's the intro to how yeah, brutal he it, is it, it is the intro um and I just really liked it. Uh, not necessarily. I guess you could kind of class it as a fight scene, but I merely just see it more as like a moment in the prologue. Mm-hmm. Um, is the forest where he gets picked up by the caravan? Um, mainly just because one of the most memorable co- quotes comes from that chapter. Um, as long as he died happy or doing something, I fuck. <laughs> I say I say it's memorable, but then I fuck it up. But it's it's something along the lines of like, um, it doesn't matter what he was doing as long as he died happy. Um, it was pretty much along those lines. Uh, there's not only that moment, but there's also guts, um, like basically warning this group, this this old man and his daughter or granddaughter. I don't remember which one it is. Basically, just saying, hey. I am a threat. I am someone you don't want to be around. Do not associate with me. And they're just like, oh, you're just you're just blabbing on. Get in, get in. And then old man gets stabbed by his granddaughter or daughter who gets taken over by a ghost. And then Guts has to essentially cleave this toddler in half. Um yeah. and it's it's like, whoa, what the fuck? And then you also immediately after see Guts recoil and start puking because you then later learn, oh, this is the first time he's killed a kid, and he regrets doing that. So, like, it's just, like, one of those scenes that, like, really stuck to me. Um, It's also a scene that gets memed to shit because of the 2016 anime and how awful the scene is done. Um... But that the like the the snake fight um, and the forest 
uh, the forest scene are probably like the two biggest things I would take from it. Um, and then if I had to do like a favorite panel, I'd probably say when you f- uh, when you first get introduced to the God Hand. Uh, uh, and yes. they're standing on like all the different staircases. That's a that's a really cool scene. It's that very got cool. Dropped, I guess. It 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 kind of got dropped, but it like also happened. So I don't really know what to take from it. Um, not a lot of people do. It's kind of hard to know where that's placed. All you know is it's in between the end of Golden Age and the start of Conviction when Guts sets out on his journey. That's pretty much all we know. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's someone out there who's kind of like pieced it together and like really knows the intricacies of it. Um, but for me and my small brain, that's pretty much <laughs> what I see. It's just it happens in between two arcs, even though it happens at the beginning of the at the beginning of the story. Chronologically, it happens in between the Golden Age and Conviction. And the end of it just kind of gets forgotten about. So, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about Black Swordsman. It's more of a means to show you, actually show you Griffith before Golden Age starts. Yes. And to reinforce this whole, why does Guts absolutely hate this guy? Yeah. Well, let me tell you why Guts absolutely hates this guy. (laughs) Enter the Golden Age. Oh, are you are you guys not gonna pull anything for Black Swordsman? Unless no no idea of anything to say, I don't personally. What do you? Are, what are we are we talking about fights or panels or what? Just general consensus, like favorite panels, favorite fights, uh, favorite um, moments. I mean, the only I don't really have anything to say about any individual arc and its panels or fights. I didn't I didn't really have a favorite fight scene, if I'm being honest. Yeah, um, which is which is understandable. But, They're all great. I guess my favorite panel would be any panel that is like solid black and is just a character or a couple characters. Oh, um, um I guess you could kind of say like how Guts first kills in the prologue where like he's shrouded in darkness and you just see his sword and his eye. Yeah, any panel yeah. where it does that, where he's solid black and it's just his eye, or it's just solid black in general. Yeah. Um. There's a panel. It's before the Golden Age, of Guts when he was a kid. Um. And he's got like his he's got like his sleeping bag on the ground, and that's wrapped around him, and then he's also sleeping on top of his sword, but it's it's solid black, and the only, like light or like white parts is him in the folds of the blanket yeah uh there's the one where he's a uh he's wrapped his cloak around jill there's one with griffith after he gets rescued um it's solid black and it's just him and his sword on the ground and he's trying to reach for it there's the there's one at the end of uh lost children where jill is talking about guts and she's like for an instance swaying inside the blaze he was the one who looked more like a terrifying monster and that that's another one which they he he moves away from the solid black and starts like doing like flames around guts which is actually a key plot point but just about just about any panel where it's like that was probably is like my favorite panels yeah artistic choice Enhances storytelling. True. Enter Golden Age. So Golden, Age Golden Age on its own is an amazing story. Like if you oh, took yeah. just Golden Age, it'd still be a great story. It wouldn't really. It would just have a. It would just have a really tragic ending, and yeah, then it'd have a tragic yeah. ending and a very like tragic cliffhanger as well. <laughs> yeah, but damn, Golden Age is good. Yeah, Golden Age by itself is very substantial and is widely considered as probably the best arc in the series. That's not my personal uh, choice Debatable. in terms of favorites. Um, but I can safely say I understand why everyone likes it and it is a close, probably second on my list. 
Um, but I'll get into my favorites later. Um, if I had to pick, um, like specific moments from Golden Age, um, there's not really a favorite chapter I have in general, but like some general pages I have that are my favorites or panels. Um, actually, I can just lead it off with my favorite fight from it is, um, a really short one, but it's Guts versus Griffith when he's when guts is leaving the band of the hawk agreed i would say that's probably the highlight of the fights even though there's some other ones that are pretty good in there i would say for me at least guts versus griffith when he's leaving the band of the hawk is my favorite even though it's only like a few panels it even though it's only a few panels the the things that happen in said panels speaks such volume and no dialogue just action yeah just dialogue no dialogue there's like maybe two lines that are said and it's mainly just action and then afterwards it just it just leads to the most craziest sequence of events that happen throughout this throughout the story and it's just a really amazing scene and my favorite panel act one of my favorite panels comes from that scene and that's um i want to say it's chapter 36 page 12 um where guts got it down to a t i didn't go that deep (laughs) um it's where it's where guts um breaks griffith's sword and then stops right at his shoulder it's the it's the two pager yep um yep. and that scene is just so fucking good it's so highly detailed you can see the weight of the swords as they're being moved and it's just oh it's so good that was like the first big jaw-dropping moment in the entire series i remember i stopped after that chapter for the night and i messaged these two i was like oh my god <laughs> that was crazy <laughs> also now that i say that i think <laughs> i think there is dialogue well there's there's words there's you can yes. you you go through both guts and griffith's thoughts in the fight yes i don't remember how much dialogue is said though but you see it's... both their thoughts before yeah. the fight yeah pretty much the only spoken dialogue is Casca and the group watching them fight, but the only like like the main dialogue is Griffith and Guts thinking, and it's just them going back and forth, and then eventually the fight just ends with Griffith's sword broken and Guts clearly the victor with his sword at his shoulder and practically on his neck. It's such an amazing scene, um, and is one of the big highlights of the golden age chapter 47 page 19 pr- pretty much the ending page um that's uh a few chapters after the confession um that guts makes to Casca uh, at the waterfall and they embrace um it's the ending page where uh you see a kid guts sitting on a tree and it says, as I dozed off, for some reason, I recalled myself as a boy rubbing in the medicine Gambino gave me. Besides the boy, an, oversu- an oversized sword shine dimly. And, and then below that, you see Guts and Casca laying together on the ground. And you may, like, at first you may think, oh, like, it's kind of weird that Guts is reminiscing, like, on his old self with his sword. But then you look at it as casca is griffith's sword and she has she mentions this uh too in prior chapters and so you then look at it as guts and his sword now that they are together and it's this really touching scene and it's one of my favorite panels out of the entire series and it's so simplistic And it's kind of weird because it's just like, oh, it's an after sex scene. Why is that so (laughs) why like why is that so impactful to you? And it's I don't know. It's just I really enjoy it. And it's 
there's just something about it that I can't specifically put in the words that I just truly am captivated by it. Um, and I could say that about a lot of different panels. Um, and my favorite panel from the latter half of the Golden Age, the last my last panel, um, it's page 82, or chapter 82, page 11, which is um, Guts in the midst of fighting a shit ton of apostles. And um, it's mainly in particular the one where he's up in the air and he's got the spike in his hands and he's like oh, pushing yeah. down into one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so cool. There's so many panels from the eclipse itself that I could say are really good and my favorites. That's but, true. That's true. Like that's probably one of the my better ones. Um, some honorable mentions would also be like the guts rage that a lot of people use, um, where it's all just like scan scan lines. Uh, down yep. the page, and he's screaming for Griffith. Yep. Um, also, um, just the sheer beauty of the eclipse itself. It's like a brutal kind of beauty, um, with all of like the different intricacies woven into the design of the eclipse and the God Hand itself. It's it's beautiful artwork. It's grotesque artwork, but it's beautiful and highly detailed. In the Eclipse, even though it's tragic and not linked with beauty, there's a lot of beauty that can be found within the detailed artwork. Um, Mira, Mira must have just been like the most crazy imaginative person ever. Like, you look at the God Hand and other like beasts in Berserk, and you're like, it's so insanely detailed. It's like, where do you even start? with these drawings right. how do you begin the how do you begin to think about something like this and then draw it and then visualize it in such a beautiful way right it's insane and there's also like there's also like original creatures that he makes but then there's also like other creatures that you would see like fictionalized in other pieces of media like for instance the trolls and goblins in the later chapters like you you normally think of like trolls goblins and orcs as like these green sort of ugly looking creatures but the way miura paints them they he paints them in such a different light yet you can literally see the comparisons between those creatures and like the modernized creatures that we know and it's like how are these the same thing even though they look completely different they are the same thing. How do you do it? It's just, it's beautiful. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about Golden Age. Um, well, actually, one quick thing. Um, when Casca falls off the edge for the first time, and Guts goes to save her, and they chill in the cave, um, and like that whole sequence, that was really nice because it's sort of like a reversal act of what happened at the beginning of Golden Age when Guts gets recruited. Um, because now instead of Casca forcing or being forced to sleep with Guts to keep him warm, it's now the opposite, where Guts is having to be close to her to keep her warm and to save her life. Um it's a, it's a really nice moment, and I really enjoyed that scene. So that's pretty much all I have to say about Golden Age so far. Uh, Noah, do you have anything to say about Which Golden one? Uh, Cyborg. Mm, not really. This, I mean, this is good. <laughs> my favorite fight scene doesn't... When does the Golden Age end? It's been, uh, 90, it's been a while. 94, 94, 95. It's like the the last thing I remember in Golden Age is uh, that's getting picked up by Skull Knight, and Skull Knight's like, "This is your life now." Yeah, per pretty much. Yeah. So, probably my favorite fight scene actually does come from Golden Age. It's um 
probably in the 60s. It's after they rescue Griffith. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's like. And he's uh, fighting. They're fighting up the staircase. Yep. That's, uh, yeah. that's, that's pretty a good much one. The 60s. And then, actually, another really good panel. Uh, favorite fight scene is probably them running up the staircase and then them in the tunnels. Mm -hmm. And those are really like the only two standout battles that I actually really enjoyed. Gotcha. No, there's really nothing more I can add to Golden Age that has already been said. Golden Age. <laughs> I got some. I got I got I got one in each. Uh favorite fight in Golden Age. I'm not like I don't remember specifically a lot of fights, but I guess the one that like stands out to me most because it's referenced even just in the story itself more than once is Guts versus the like hundred men. Mm-hmm. That's that lives on literally in the story. And it's it's infamous, so that's that's a key one to go back to. And then, uh, I have no idea. I don't know pe the the chapters and page numbers like Manix did. I did not go that in depth. I'm just going off which ones I saved in my camera roll. But there's a <laughs> there's a panel of like really detailed textured guts screaming with his sword over his shoulder. Right as the band of the hawk are charging to the final battle, well, yeah. on, what's that city called? The last battle, like when they were charging to uh, fight, like the purple rhinos or whatever their team was called, their band. I know what you're talking about, but like the capital or whatever. I don't remember the specific name. The, I, I, yeah, the, like, I know the like big main, the big main. It was like their final fight. The, yes. fi the final fight. So yeah, there's like that panel of guts uh screaming as as they all charge in, but it's just like it's just guts, but right before it they show like the entire band of the hawk. And that was yep. a powerful moment as well. But yeah, that's really all I have to say. Oh, and there's also that panel where guts comes back after he leaves the band of the hawk and then comes back a year later. Yep. That's a good one. Very good. That's uh, that's about all I have to say about Golden Age too. Maddox really, Maddox really knows how to put it into words <laughs> <laughs> for us. All right. Well, from the Golden Age, we uh, do we want to talk about the the like little mini arc that happens first, the controversial one, I guess you could say, because I think that's what's next, right? Lost Children, aka the start of Conviction. Yes, we'll 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 do Lost Children first, and then move into Conviction overall. Okay. Unless you want to just do Conviction. I would just rather do Conviction overall. Because let's just talk about conviction. conviction. Um, fuck, I can't find this panel in like a merge state. Um, so Conviction. Uh. Conviction, even though I don't like Tower Conviction with Mozgus, Conviction is my favorite uh, arc out of the out of the entire series. Um, and even though it's supposed to be like Guts's low point, um, there are a lot of things about not only his character but other characters that get introduced that I just really enjoy about the series. And, um. I I don't know. I don't know how to put it into words. It's just a lot of the things that happen to Guts throughout Conviction um, that allow him to grow as a character, I just really enjoyed. Um, it's essentially really rock like, bottom, you could say. Yeah. Um, and I just, I really enjoyed it. Um, with Lost Children being my favorite, like, I guess, arc of the of the entire series with um i don't remember what this like this the sub arc name of it is but essentially the berserker armor arc in millennium falcon um that's like a close second the lost children is like my favorite um for for a lot of reasons uh with jill being like 
a figure of guts and he like sees himself in her and is one of the reasons why he can't like go through and kill her even if she gets in his way um there's also just like a lot of things that happen to guts throughout lost children that you see and you're just like you you really didn't need to do that but it shows just how lost he is in his rage and once he finally comes out of it um at the end he starts letting people in after shutting himself off for for like a good like while he finally lets someone new back in that being puck and it kind of starts his his journey back out of the hole that he's dug himself into um and there's a lot of things that i just really like about lost children um and conviction as a whole um and there's a lot of panels that i really enjoy my favorite fight from it is guts versus rosine uh mainly the main ending of it where she goes like full form and like they're flying through the air and he blasts his cannon through her and shit it's it's a really cool fight um and i really enjoyed it um surprisingly though that doesn't house my favorite panels from it um my favorite panels come from uh the first chapter being 108 page two um that is the chapter where we first i want to say it's the first introduction to the guts cannon spin where he holds his sword backwards so he's holding it by like the end of the handle and he holds it on his metal arm and then blasts his cannon and spins around in a circle yeah that was awesome and he he cuts the praying mantis and like the the giant beetle with it and it's so cool it's a double page panel that's just so highly detailed and it when when I personally saw it, I was like, oh my god. And I was taken aback by how like cool it was and just how pretty it looked. Um so that was really nice. Um and then a little bit more of a of a subtler thing. Actually looking at it, it's not really that subtle. Um, but uh chapter uh 111 page 24 uh it's when guts is in the nest of um all the fairies and shit (laughs) yes and and he is just covered in blood and he's got like entrails in his mouth and he's just covered from head to toe he's got like a child's body on him like a skeleton like it's really morbid but it's also just portrayed in a way that shows that guts will literally do anything to kill apostles to get his goal done and it's a well crafted panel that's done on a single page that even though there's no text it's just him standing there there's so much that could be said about it and it's really nice and well crafted i say that about everything i just probably <laughs> said that like a good 10 Can we get a times well now. crafted counter but oh, it's just it's so good Can we um, get a guts counter too how many times have we yeah. said guts uh another uh, another page is a few chapters later in 117 um a very popular panel where guts is standing in the cave with jill and jill's trying to follow him and basically ask him to let her in and he's basically just saying take a look a good look around us take a good hard look at the shadows at the darkness around me and he is shrouded in darkness and then behind him is just all these morbid and like decrepit looking faces that surround him in the darkness of this cave and 
oh my god it's so cool looking it it really goes to show that mira has a way of writing scenarios that don't even really need a lot of writing in them probably doesn't make too much sense comparing it to this panel but like you can really tell that you shouldn't be around guts and going with him is like a major risk and he's just constantly saying that and there's a few instances where you see it and you're just like oh but that's probably like a one like a once kind of one and done kind of deal but then you get this scene where you see it for yourself even though they're pretty safe you look up and you just see that he is constantly tormented and surrounded by these demons and he is never safe and so going with him would probably mean you're risking your life it's a well-crafted scene that like it just goes to show how good of an artist and writer mira is and how well crafted the story can be at times um and then my final panel actually comes from the uh, after the tower actually no it's before the tower i think um where guts is finally reunited with Casca, and he um chops down all the people that are held like holding her hostage about to burn her essentially um it's chapter 148 page 9 and he's just standing there with all of these bodies being flung away and like you can see the dust being kicked up from his sword swing and she's like Casca's just sitting there just looking up at him and it's just a beautiful scene I can't really speak much other than that. It's just a really beautiful scene. And it's it's another one of those things that I just really like about Conviction is the the reunion between Guts and Casca um after 2 years of being separated. It's it's a really touching scene, even though there's no dialogue ex uh, exchanged in this panel specifically. It's really nice. Well, have you know you stole my answer because that's also my favorite panel in Conviction. The the reunion. The specifically my favorite panel. Panel. <laughs> my favorite panel specifically is that one where his cape is like in front of him. And yep. all the enemies are falling behind him. The dust yep. is kicked up from a sword. And he's staring like Dana Koska, turning back to look at her. That's one yep. of my like favorite panels in the entire series. I it's really so like good. that panel. And I really like there are other two after that that are just close ups of Guts's face and all the sweat and steam on his face. Yeah. Besides that, I also have uh after the night with uh when he flees like farnese's camp and farnese like is with him fighting like the demons for the first time it's oh, yeah. like a panel of him it's he's doing the the tokyo ghoul thing he's throwing his head back yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good one i like that the one that's more um it's a very good scene that's like way more hash marking or like i don't i don't remember what it's called but it's like it it's almost a different coloring style than what is usually done. Because mm -hmm. nothing is like fully black. It's hash marks. So yep. that one sticks out to me. And then the last one is one I used as my screensaver for a while on my phone is when uh the Tower of Conviction freaking the God Hand is summoned and Guts is he like gets up and he stands up and he's like, Wait, where am I? And then the the panel shows him standing there on the hand and the hand is silhouetted in the background. Yep. Really like that one. 
Those are my favorite panels and convictions. Favorite fight and conviction? Guts versus Serpica. Easily. Yeah. <laughs> like I said earlier. But Guts versus, uh, what's her name again? Rosaline? Rosine. Rosine, thank you. Yeah, that's also a really good one. Uh, yeah, that's about all I have to say about conviction. And also, introduction to Farnese. Let's go. Very true. Uh, Noah, do you have anything to say about conviction? Um, yes, actually. So, I cannot remember where it was at all, and I'm starting to doubt if it was even in Berserk at all. <laughs> but do you remember a panel at all where, like, Guts essentially snips back to reality and goes, no, wait, I want to go back? He's He's fighting something. Um, and he basically, like, every time he goes to, even though he's, actually, I'll get to that later. Basically, whenever he goes to fight something, he basically just goes blank and lets all of his anger out, and that's how he's able to fight so hard. Do you remember, like, something like that at all? Um, I would say yes, but I that's also because... I thought it was, like, around when they have the entire party, and it's, like, around the beach or something like that. Um... Yes, then? that happens in the, Millennium. Um, right? Yes. No, that happens in uh, Fantasia, like early Fantasia, I want to say. No. Or maybe it's late Millennium. It's whenever he has the Berserker armor. It's yes, not it's, in af it's after he gets the Berserker armor, but it's before they set sail. Yeah. I don't know. The, you, can, you can see like an early version of that after he... Um, uh, like the panel where he's got the fairy over his shoulder and the guts are everywhere. And it's like his white eyes. And they're yes. like questioning what he was doing. That really wasn't guts per se. That was essentially the beast that has been festering inside. The beast of darkness, yes. Yeah, since like the beginning. I just thought that was a, a really cool detail looking back on it. Yeah, that's a very nice panel. And then like when he gets the, the armor... And it start like it starts to have those effects on him, and you can really see it there. Like he's starting to lose himself, mm -hmm. and how like they kind of foreshadow that kind of. It was nice. Yes. Conviction is cool. Conviction is very cool. Like all of Berserk. Yes. But you know what else is cool? Whatever Money the Falcon. F yeah, whatever the fuck this next arc is called, because I've heard a hundred different titles for it. Okay, all right. Do you want a history course? Uh oh, there's a history course on this title. No, I've basically I've explained it to you before. Um, yeah. The, to my understanding, the original arc in Japan was called the Millennium Falcon arc, or if if translated more literally, Falcon of the Millennium Empire. When it was brought over to the states, they had to change it. And so it was called Hawk of the Millennium Empire. Um, obviously, it's a reference to Star Wars. It's an intentional reference to Star Wars. Um, He's a Star Wars fan. Uh, yeah. But it's basically, to just simplify it, it's just called the Millennium Falcon arc. Um. So yeah, that's chapters like 177 to like 307. Um, so like a, a good chunk of the story. The longest arc. Um, I think. That is true. I want to say. Um, so to kind of kickstart it. Um, I have a lot of panels from this. Um, oh, I forgot the... Uh, Go back. Can we do like rewind? No, no, can can we do like favorite like like can I go into in depth about favorite chapters after we do all this chronological shit? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll okay. do that at the end. Because why not? Because I completely forgot about that, and I, I have too. a lot to say about certain chapters, and we've already passed some of them. So understandable. Um. So we'll do that later. We'll do but, that. At the end. Um. Favorite fights from Millennium Falcon. Uh are probably Guts versus Zod on the Hill of Swords. Um, that fight just was really nice to see. It was also really 
interesting to see how Griffith interacted with everyone because he was just there kind of idly watching. Um, and even though like he like during the fight, he, he kind of states that he feels nothing and has no emotions left. He then goes out of his way to save Casca, which if he if he didn't feel anything, he wouldn't have done that. So either he's lying or he subconsciously did it. Um, and also just the sword play between God, uh, God, God, Zod and guts. I mean, might as well be <laughs> between between guts and Zod, like the sword play. It's really nice, but. I also have to tie it up with Guts versus Grunbelt in the forest. Let's get the Berserker armor. I'd agree with that, that. That fight is amazing. And, like, oh, there's so many good things about it. But, like, the main thing is just how quickly... Like, cause, cause normally the armor is just like the standard armor with the skull helmet, but we qu very quickly see that Guts lets his anger overtake him while he's in the armor, just because he now has the uh, uh, essentially the immunity to pain, even though he's still being injured. The armor forces his body back together, and he doesn't feel pain. So, like, he's still being hurt, but he doesn't feel any of it. And he then just gets succumb like succumbed by rage. Um and we very quickly see that then literally take over the armor. And that is just so cool. And then it's also like it's it's just really cool to see how easily he adapted to the armor and was able to utilize its mobility and its durability and how much stronger it made him and i'll be pretty brief with this but power scaling and a lot of other animes are pretty jank and can sometimes just feel kind of out of nowhere when the, when the protagonist gets a new upgrade it's just kind of like oh i now have a new upgrade for the sake of the plot and i didn't really work my ass off for this over the story of berserk guts is focused on constantly building himself up to be peak human. And by the end of the Golden Age, you could pretty much say that he is peak man. He is able to wield a giant ass sword that, while be it pretty skinny, is still a feat that not a lot of people can do. And he's also able to wield the sword that was used by a literal monster at one point. So, needless to say, he's a strong ass dude. And he comes out of the eclipse both injured in his sight and in his physical strength by losing an arm. He then says, fuck that. I'm going to get stronger. And with a missing arm, somehow gets stronger and becomes even more peak human. And over the course of the story, up until the point that he gets the Berserker armor, he is now, instead of living in a human versus human world, he is now slowly transforming into human versus monster world. And so, while in his conditions, he can beat pretty much any human and, like, most lower-level monsters, when he starts fighting the army that Griffith is building, he's gonna need some extra leverage. But he can't get any extra leverage he's already done everything that he can he's quite literally the epitome of the strongest man in the world the berserker armor feels like such a nice upgrade because it's that little push he needs to get the edge on his enemies he has worked his ass off to the point that he deserves the armor and it's one of the greatest power-ups that I can safely say that I have seen in anime and any like piece of media really because it it feels deserved. It doesn't feel half-assed or out of nowhere. He worked his ass off, got to the point where he earned the armor and it helped him in the end. Yes, it does have repercussions and it's technically slowly killing him over time, but he knows the consequences and yet he still pushes on and uses it to its fullest extent to do what he needs to do. 
Well, that's part of the reason it's also a good power up is because of how risky it is to use. Exactly. And they express multiple times, pretty much every time the berserker comes out, it's like, oh my god, guts, do not do this. And he's like, mm, it's it's fine, I'll be all right. Just pull me out, and then he and then he's gone. <laughs> he's yeah. Gone. And and along with that. Um, with Shirake helping him to make sure that he doesn't completely destroy himself in his armor and in his rage, it also just goes to show how much he's trusted his companions over the course of the story. Because before, like, he knew Puck could help him, but he didn't really utilize that. He was just kind of like, if you want to help me, you can, but I don't really give a shit. Then when he finally gets to the point where he starts using the Berserker armor and he's with his full party, he trusts them enough to the point where he goes, I'm going to go do my thing. I know you're going to save me and help me. So don't worry about saying anything. And then just goes. And Shirake is just like, that dumbass. And then saves him. Which is like, it, it just goes to show how much he's grown. And it's so good. Oh, <laughs> love the series. Um, hey, can you tell? <laughs> can you oh. tell we like the Zerk? <laughs> We're not even done yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like Guts versus Zod on the Hill of Swords and then Guts versus Grunveld are like the two biggest fights from Millennium Falcon that I see as like the big heavy hitters of it. Um. And then for favorite panels, uh, I actually have a lot, but most of them come from a single chapter. Um, the first one is 178, page 13. That's when Guts is talking to Griffith on the Hill of Swords, and Griffith literally just says, I'll not betray my dream. That is all. And it's this very beautiful like picture of Griffith, just straight-faced, calm, collected, and Guts is just losing it. He, he is just maddened by the words that, this, that he's saying. And he just can't comprehend it and just starts losing it. And like a few pages back, there's also the panel of like Guts. like It's a close-up of Guts and it's a two-pager uh, looking at Griffith. And then the next two pages is just this full panel of uh, Griffith standing there. And those panels are also really nice. Um, but page 13 is probably my favorite out of that chapter. And then uh, chapter 226, page 9 and 11. 9 being the first, uh, not like the first introduction, but the full look we get to see of the Beast of Darkness. Um, and it's when Guts is like in the armor listening to the beast of darkness just saying go out go unleash your rage do it and just start screaming at him it's a really cool panel and then a few pages later it's the armor fully transformed and it's the armor screaming um which is a panel that is shared a lot and is um, probably one of the more better known panels to come out from the series just because of how iconic it is. It's also been ruined by the 2016, <laughs> 2017 anime. I knew this um, was going to be brought up. But I, I I won't really touch up on that. Pretty much, it's a really good and iconic scene from the series. If you've only and... seen the transformation from the anime of 2016, 2017 of the Berserker armor, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're hurting yourself. Go watch any other one. It's probably better. If there's only three adaptations of the armor, there's the PS2 game, the 2016 game, uh, and the anime. The anime has good music, but bad animation and bad transformation. The PS2 game has a good transformation, but a kind of sloppy overall presentation. And then the 2016 game doesn't necessarily have a transformation but has a very well crafted scene made overall so it's like you get one good thing out of each source um the yeah, manga is the scene, best yeah but but overall the manga is the best even though it's literally just a still picture it's still better than what the 
anime did for it um so it's a really nice panel um and then everything else uh from millennium falcon pretty just pretty much just comes from chapter 228 where shirke is going into um guts's like psyche and his soul to try and help him uh the first page is um uh page 11 where uh shirke sees the beast of darkness and it's like this un- enlarged form where he's like covered in flames and it's just showing like the fueling rage that is the beast of darkness that's inside guts and it's a very very lovely yet terrifying picture um that represents like guts's rage in a whole and then um two pages later page 13 um usually manga panels will have like boxes like even if it's a full pager sometimes they will also have like different boxes that lead down into it but to sort of show the motion of uh shirke being consumed by the flames as she goes down it's three different boxes of her going down into the flames of the beast of darkness and it's this really pretty scene where the background is consistent but her position changes and it's a really nice way of showing motion in a single page i really enjoy this panel for like pretty much those reasons it's very pretty it shows a good way of doing motion and it's a really unique way of doing motion i've never seen something done like this before yet it feels like it's something that a lot of people should be doing um to to show motion in in pictures essentially so that's really nice and then page 16 of that same chapter uh it's shirke floating through the uh remnants of the eclipse that's in guts's mind um it's a really beautiful yet terrifying and grotesque um two pager that it's it's just so highly detailed and there's like little things here and there that you could definitely say are i guess not necessarily references but i guess you could say references to the the um original band of the hawk members that get killed off like judeo pippin corcus all of them you can kind of like see the monsters that kill those people um and those characters in this page and you can also just see the other traumatic things that happen in this page and then you can also see like uh Casca being pinned up by one of the monsters in the far back and the god hand and griffith at the top it's so it's just oddly beautiful and it's one of those panels that i i also was just taken aback by how scarily good it is um and then the last page of that chapter, chapter uh, page 19, is um, uh, Shirake finally reaching Guts, and it's just him as like a, f- a, a lingering flame that's really like tiny compared to everything else that's going on in him. And the only thing that you can see is like the berserker eye uh, to represent his only eye um it's 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 a really nice panel and it's very simplistic yet again simplicity that speaks volume that speaks so many words and it's it's beautiful i love it it's it's such a good chapter in general like even though it's not like one of my favorites 228 is very good chapter and is up there in like my top like like my top chapters um so that's pretty much all i have to say about millennium falcon um what do you guys 
want to talk about? Nice. Uh, my favorite panels are the Berserker armor. <laughs> <laughs> I really like how the Berserker armor looks before it transforms. I think it is a cool design. And I have two pictures from when the Berserker armor like is first shown mm. that I really love. I really like how the Berserker armor looks before it's transformed. Don't get me wrong. I like the design when it's transformed. It's cool, it's brutal, it's beastly, and it's absolutely, you know, stunning. But I really like how the original armor looks. I think it looks really cool. And I like the helmet. The skull and stuff like that. It's cool. It's a cool armor. Really cool armor. And like yes. we mentioned, one of the best power-ups ever. Yeah. Uh, Favorite fight? Definitely... Guts versus what's his name again? Grumbeld? Yes, Grumbeld. Grumbeld, yep. Yeah. Introduction of Berserker Armor. Amazing fight. Let's gut like just when you thought Guts couldn't get any more cool. Like holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> really taking it to the next level. Uh also <laughs> you know me. Favorite favorite other fight, the rematch between Serpico versus Guts. <laughs> that is a really cool fight. That is a very good I fight. really like that fight. Serpico's a very 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 clever man. And you some may think like, oh that's cheap. Serpico is still willing to challenge Guts after seeing him in the Berserker armor and knowing that Guts is like the strongest man ever. And <laughs> Serpico's like, yeah, I'll still find him. Yeah, yeah, I I got a chance. He gives know? him a limiter just by the room. And honestly, you could say the pillars don't even limit guts that much. Yeah. He slices through them like it's butter. And Serpico still manages to hold his own. Hmm. Really like that fight. Um... Introduction of Sher-K. Uh Also, did we... I think it's in Millennium Falcon. The very end, right before Fantasia. But did we mention the panel, Skull Knight? And now that we're in spoiler territory, we can say it now, Femto slash Griffith. Did we oh, say that panel? Oh, that, yeah. Just that moment in general, too. Big that moment, moment, big panel very cool um with uh with um griffith finally like confronting uh ganishka and like basically saying yeah this is it and then um him luring skull knight into starting the world tree and like basically just fucking over a lot of things um it's a very cool panel i can like i would say i could probably add that onto like my favorite panels list um i i like i can i forgot about it um even though <laughs> I, I like like don't get me wrong it's a really good panel but when i was like searching for panels to like talk about for this um it just it slipped my mind and it, it it is a really good panel though uh the the detail in it is really well done skull knight's sword is really fucking cool and the way he's just you know he's just got it right next to to griffith's neck and it's just like eh, you know it's whatever after he literally cuts through space time to just get there it's so cool um but yeah that's the millennium falcon do we move on to the last arc yeah now fantasia actually can i can we talk about how that is one of my favorite panels just because it took maddox so long to find <laughs> <laughs> i think we mentioned that at the start didn't we yes we did but we i don't think we could talk about it because we weren't in spoiler territory yet hey, you said you said skull knight versus femto which uh, good on remembering, because I don't think I would have remembered. <laughs> That's not the first time I've done something like that. What, been our savior? I mean, you're literally a hero. Uh, I know. 
<laughs> Still waiting on that paycheck, by the way. <laughs> no, I mean like, like when we we've been talking about something, and then it's like someone who plans on either playing or watching whatever it is, and then like, like with with you and Persona, there there were a couple times where I had to change characters' names just so that you wouldn't be spoiled on it. Mm-hmm. I'm sit. Hey, for those for those who are unaware, sometimes I'm sitting in a Discord call with these guys. And then they start talking about Persona, or Maddox will be like, when Noah was playing Persona 4, Maddox would be like, where are you at in Persona right now? And Noah would be like, oh, man, this part, but I can't get into it. And then just, they, but they'd, you, I could tell that both of them were just dying to talk about it. We were and it would get to the point code. where they would freaking, like, talking cut, and I was like, guys, you just want me to deafen? And then it started getting to the point where they would deafen me. <laughs> I, I, like, I, I feel bad. But like I, I understand. I, I, I understand. It's okay. That's how we also kind of were with Berserk at the start, where you didn't read it, but then you didn't want to be spoiled on it. So <laughs> me, me and Noah had to like try and speak in code. I don't even um, remember. I can't. I can't even begin to remember those like conversations. But yeah, so Fantasia, um, the most recent arc, and um, not a lot of people's favorites, um, surprisingly. Uh, I, I can like understand. Is it under the content that's in it or because of the situation we're in right now? Um, the content. I feel <laughs> like Berserk also hits a point for a lot of people when you're reading it to where it just kind of starts to slow down. And mm. conviction and Fantasia, like between those two parts, that's where it kind of slowed down for me. I can I yeah. can see that. I can kind of agree with that, but I not totally, but I can see it. Mm -hmm. Um, Fantasia for me was like, I I was still like really excited to keep reading, and it kept me captivated through the entire thing. Same. Um, and like while. A lot of people uh, would probably say that um, when Fantasia started and, like, there was the whole pirate arc and then, like, it goes into Sea God stuff. Um, while a lot of people would say, like, this, uh, the pirate stuff was, like, kind of filler, I can kind of see that, but I see it more as a way of allowing Roderick to be um, sort of incorporated into the group more. And sort of build trust along the the group as a whole, um, and then Sea God is a way of further, uh, further connecting both Shirke and Guts as a as a collective, um, and allowing Guts to sort of hone in on his ability of controlling the Berserker armor, um, and then is also the introduction of the One Mermaid Lady that kind of gives Isidro a companion. So now everyone's kind of linked up where Guts has uh, Shirke and Casca. Casca doesn't technically have anybody, but she has both Guts and Farnese. Farnese has Serpico, and then Isidro has now the Mermaid Lady. I'm forgetting her name, and I feel really stupid because I feel like I should know her name. Um... Let me let me look it Isn't up. Isn't that Isma, or is that a different character? Uh, I think yeah, Isma. Yeah, that's her name. Uh, she now acts as like the companion for Isidro, and it kind of gives everyone a, a companion that they can work with, and I I just think it's really nice. Um, but I can definitely see why people thought it was like a slower a slower sort of arc, um, especially coming off of the things that happened prior with like the um zod and ganishka fight um and like the whole berserker arc as a whole um but i still think fantasia is a good arc uh and it there's a lot of really good moments in it that i that i enjoy um oh fuck i did not go over that 
in my panels list. That's what uh -oh. I'll go into it when I talk about it because it's my favorite chapter. Um, so brushing over the panels from my favorite chapter, I'll go into that later. Um, to start off, Fantasia for my favorite. Actually, I'll go off with favorite fight first. Um, which there's not really much that happens in Fantasia. There's like a bunch of like small fights, I guess you could put. But like the, I would say the big, the big main one is Guts versus Sea God, and that's pretty much what I'd go with. Um, I just think it's really cool the way it's portrayed, and overall the fight was really cool, especially up and near the end where. Farnese is using her magic and everything, and there's all the mermaids in the water. Um, and like Guts being on the inside, and he's like got to keep himself sturdy while he's like being essentially shook into the core by the heartbeat of the monster that he's inside. It's a really cool fight, and I think a lot of people, mm, sorry, I think a lot of people, um, kind of brush it off as like a sort of filler fight. Um, because they don't see it as high, as highly as the other fights. Um, which I personally don't agree with, but I can at least sort of understand why people would see that. Um, but that's pretty much my my take on the fight. Um, I agree with that. I don't really have much else to say other than that. Uh, uh for favorite panels, oh. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was I was just gonna piggyback off that since we're talking about it. I think, uh, I would like it's not like solid in my brain, but I if I had to say there is a favorite mind of mine, I would argue gut like the Sea God fight is my favorite fight in the entire series. Mm -hmm. I think it's the most unique fight. I think it's the most dynamic fight. I think it has the most moving pieces going on out of any fight, and I think. It's it's um it's the one that guts gets the most beat up in. I think it's easily the easy or not easy. Well, it's from my point of view at least, it was the most like serious beating guts has taken in a fight we've seen. Like mm -hmm. he was pretty he was pushing it on death. Like he got yeah. he had to get the freaking Maros to save him. And shit like that. It was a close call. He was getting absolutely fucked. But he still did yeah. it. So, and I think another reason why I like Fantasia as well, and I would disagree that Fantasia is good, and why this fight is also good, I feel like there's an argument to be made that Fantasia is almost, in a sense, a reboot. So, Millennium Falcon ends this it has this huge conflict right and that's how it ends with the huge climax of you know the time world barrier whatever being split and now there's yep now there's fantasy elements everywhere that is no longer like just contained to guts as a character now it's like a reboot of this world because now everyone has to adapt to these these creatures that are living yep. in the world and are you know just common now everyone and you know Griffith's Falconia and shit like that. So I'd argue Fantasia is almost kind of like a reboot. We're not necessarily starting at square one again, but we're starting with, all right, this is our this is our party. These are the enemies that they have to fight. Let's see how they deal with it. it and it's yeah. almost like a new refreshing kind of take on it, almost, you could yeah, say. I I can definitely see that. Yep. Um, fuck, I was gonna say something else and I don't even remember <laughs> it. Um, did I skip you for panels, Maddox? Uh, well, I, I was gonna let you finish and then I was gonna go on to my panels. I don't have many panels, so I'm just gonna talk about mine now. Uh, okay, the most iconic panel probably that I see everywhere is. I don't know. Maddox probably knows what chapter it is in page number. The one of the berserker armor on top of like the pirate hat on the front of the ship. The cape is like blowing up behind him and he's got the sword covered in blood over his shoulder. He's got the berserker armor on. It's my, uh, it's my iPhone wallpaper right now. 
I know, I know what page you're talking about. I don't remember off the top of my head where that's it's from. All right. And then the like panel that moved me the most made me made me cry. We'll get more into it when we get there, I'm sure, or we could get into it now. When Casca comes out after her mind is restored and it's the beautiful, beautiful fields and guts standing there yep. in the forest. Made me cry. Beautiful yeah. two-page panel. Pa uh, chapter 355, page 13. Yeah. Was that on your list? Yes. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and finish finish out your panels? We can um, move so to Noah. To kind of backtrack um, to the, the starting of Fantasia, um, uh, chapter uh, 328, page 20, it's a two-pager of the, I want to say it's the first introduction to Moonlight Child, um, where he's up in the sky, uh, on like these strands of like I don't I don't know if they're air or clouds or I don't know, but he's like standing on these strands in front of this giant moon, and it looks. Oh, no, he's he's in the tree. Yeah, he's Is in it? the he's in oh, the spirit he... tree. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also, he gets oh introduced in uh, Millennium Falcon because you see him on the beach. Right. That's not his first introduction. Yes. My mind is fried right now. I am very sorry. We've been going for a long time. It's okay. Um, but that that page, or those pages, really, it's just beautiful. It's so highly detailed, and it's just beautiful to look at i cannot wait to get a physical copy of this volume and to have this in my hands so i can just look at it and cry over it <laughs> get tear marks all over the pages yeah <laughs> it's it's just it's so pretty um a lot of the other panels come from the Casca like dream sequence and then afterwards um, so page or yep. chapter three fifty two, page seventeen. It's um, the the dog in Costco's dreams turning into the berserker dog, um, and it's like fully kitted in the armor. It it just looks really cool, and it it's cool to see like the beast of darkness being represented with the berserker armor and. It's just like it's like oh, because guts acts, acts like a like a beast when he's using the armor because he's like almost all on all fours because the beast of darkness is in him and it's a literal dog, and it's it's like a guard dog watching over Casca as it's it's just so good. I'll go into more depth when I talk about these chapters because those are on my favorite chapters list. Um. Another page comes from 354, page 2, uh, which is the two-pager where Shirke and Farnese are looking at the fetus um, while it's, like, drifting through the, the eclipse. And Shirke has already seen the eclipse before when going through Guts' mind, but that point of view was at the bottom where Costco was at the top and then the god hand was above her. This time she's experiencing it through a different lens where she's seen it from Costco's point of view where she's hoisted above all of the monsters covered by all of these like vines and she's right next to the god hand and you just see it from a completely different aspect. It's the same tragedy yet it is completely different. And um, you will also see throughout the through the monsters uh, that you see throughout this are completely different from the monsters that you actually saw during the eclipse. And you could just chalk it up to, oh, Japan weird. They all look like dick monsters um, because, you know, they do. But then take into account what Casca went through during the eclipse and then it starts slowly making sense that oh you know it, it kind of makes more sense that 
all of these monsters are dick monsters because you know she kind of got uh in a in a sticky situation she got done did yeah so it, it it makes a lot of sense and it's it's another one of those creative choices done by mira that's like it's genius that no one really like thinks about until you look more into it and it's just so good it's a really disturbing panel that is really interesting to look at um uh the final few panels come from uh 355 uh specifically page eight and page 13 um page eight is Casca after she's like finally out of it um and she's sitting there with like all of the the um like the sparkles around her and she's crying and it's like this close-up uh one page panel that's just it's so like nice to look at and even now looking at it it like makes me want to tear up a little bit just because of everything that both Casca and Guts have been through to get up to this point and with Guts knowing that there wasn't full possibility that she would come back to normal. He still risked everything to do it. And she is just so thankful for it and thankful for everything that she's been given over the course of the journey. And she can't express it until now. It's so nice. And then as you were talking about the, the page where she's in her dress and she's in the field going to guts and the with the text there's someone i want to see it's so nice and it, it it truly is like a page that will stick with me for a while um which is how beautiful it is and after seeing the sad reality of her mental state the like a few pages later where she like collapses from trauma after seeing him it it's like a bittersweet chapter yep where it's like oh i'm really happy for her and it's it's really nice to see her back but now she can't see the one that she loves anymore because of all the trauma and it it hurts and it's really sad um so there there's that um there's chapter 362 uh page 4 where we get a deep dive into the history of the armor that guts wears um and we see a prior eclipse um oh, yes that's a really cool panel it's it's not the page where we see the god hand in full uh prior to the god hand that we know now but it's the page before it where it's the hallway leading up to the god hand where it's all of these like serpent like spines that are like crossing over each other and like forming this vortex in the background it's completely different from the god hand that we see in the golden age or really the eclipse that we see in the golden age where it's all constructed of faces instead it's all of these like serpents and like all of these weird spines it's really interesting to look at and it's really cool and it's it's another one of those things that just goes to show how creative mira is and how talented he is to make something so unique and interesting and make it so detailed like it this literally is art like you could frame this shit up in a museum against like other pieces of art and go yeah that is art a lot of people write off manga art as just oh it's it's not true art you look at this shit and if you don't say that this is 
art, you're just fucking wrong. There's no, there's no doubt about it. You are just wrong. A lot of these panels in this series are just straight up art. And this page in 362 adds to that. Um, and then uh, to close it out, kind of a, of a no-brainer for me, the very last page, 364, page 26, Griffith crying. Saying that too will soon disappear with a single tear like morning dew. If you wanna, if you wanna save some of that for later, I I was planning. I didn't I didn't really mention it to you guys at the start, but I was planning on having a whole section on the last chapter and the future of yeah. Berserk. Yeah, I I will definitely talk more about it, but for right now, I'll say this is probably one of the best close ups that we've have in the series. And it probably wasn't even fully done by Miura. It was probably worked on mostly by his editing team. And it just kind of goes to show how well he trained his editing team. Um, and overall, it's just a beautifully constructed panel. Um, I'll, t- I'll talk more about that whole thing when we get there, though. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say about my favorite panels from Fantasia. Do you have anything, Cyborg? Nope. Nope. I mean, the only, not the only thing I have to say is like my favorite chapter and everything was that whole Casca, like where they do that deep dive into Casca's mind. Mm-hmm. All right. Chapters 347 to 354. Well, speaking of which, that's also one of my favorite series of chapters in the entire series was that entire dream sequence and journey of Farnes and Shirsuke through Casca's memories. It was such a trip to go back and look at everything that happened to both of them from just like, you know, a sad, beautiful, tragic, nostalgic, like everything about it just flowing mm. through that entire series of chapters. What a great, what a great set of chapters and the symbolism of, you know, Guts was a dog and whatnot and all that stuff. All that stuff. All that dead. great stuff. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. You forced my hand. Let me tell you. <laughs> you Let me tell you what he's doing. You want you want me to tell you what he's doing? I think you know yes. very well what he's doing. What's he doing? Tell me. I want to know. He killing. <laughs> he, he, he kill, he rebuild. True. Woman. He make friends. Uh, so. uh, and uh, the only other one I have to say, because I'm, I'm not going to lie, I don't have much to favorite chapters, and then I'll pass it off to one of you two. Mm-hmm. So we we kind of smoothly transitioned to favorite chapters now. Uh, I honestly don't even know which chapter number it is. Unfortunately, I tried to go back and find it like real quick, but I can't find it. And I don't remember which one specifically it is, but it's either when Farnese first like it's her luminous. Is it called the luminous body? Is that what it's called? I want to say it is when that's they, what it's called. when they first get their like spiritual bodies and are flying around the ship mm-hmm. or um or when she first like uses the force field yep on um on the seahorse in one of those scenes she starts crying and it made me cry too so that was one of my favorite chapters and that kind of goes along with why Farnes is one of my favorite characters that's why it's one of my favorite chapters, whichever one that is. It's either when she first gets luminescent body or when she first activates the shield. I don't remember which one it is. Unfortunately. I wanna say it's um uh when she's flying around the ship. Uh which is chapter Oh no 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 no. 
it's not. Um, it, it's the it's the force field one. That's what I thought. So, I thought it was the force field one. That was the one I was leaning more towards, but I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one of my other favorite chapters, I I know is one of Maddox's favorite chapters, so I'm gonna let him talk about it. But I I have I have a feeling Maddox has a lot to say about favorite chapters. No offense. So uh, <laughs> Noah, do you want to share f some favorite chapters you have? Uh, I mean, you guys already talked in length about all of them. So really, the only ones I have is uh, when he gets the Berserker armor, and when they do the deep dive into Casca's mind. Hmm. Just because of how much they use symbolism in such a, yeah. it like, I like and don't like symbolism because a lot of shows and pieces of media will just use that to carry certain sections, which I always really hate. But I think Berserk does it in a really good way. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice balance. Um. It's not force-fed like to you. And symbolism. Yeah. Um, if I had to go off of favorite chapters, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Buckle up, ladies uh, and gentlemen. I, I, have, I, have a, I have a few. It's mainly just three separate chapters and then a chapter sequence. Um, if, I had to, if I had to start chronologically, I'd go with the first one being chapter 129 called Cracks in the Blade. Um, it's when Guts comes back to Godot's, also sometimes uh, named Godot, um, goes back home to him and sees that he is basically on his deathbed. Um, and he is basically rambling on to Guts about. Um, uh, hatred and sorrow and vengeance and everything and he compares guts as a person to repairing a rusted and cracked sword and it's one of the first times we kind of see guts lose his composure in front of others that isn't like blind rage it's not like him losing his composure, going into blind rage and killing shit. It's him trying to have a conversation with someone and when they speak something that actually like, you know, he, he knows is fully well and true, he kind of doesn't want to accept it and starts losing it. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that Godot says to him is he's talking about uh, Guts' heart and says that he has some, quote, you've got some huge nicks in your heart. Damn cracks called fear running all through it. And then the next panel over, or next page, Guts starts going on about how you don't understand, you don't know what it's like to have everything, like, lost you don't know what it's like to lose everything you are here in this cozy place about to die peacefully whereas i have been through so much shit and i have lost everything no one no human can understand that it's such a powerful scene that a lot of people gloss over and it just goes to show how much the events that he has been through have affected his mental state and how much it has changed his outlook on what he wants to do with his life. And Godot tries to reassure him that by just going on a blind rage won't help him and it won't save or help the people he loves. Yet Guts still just can't accept that. And um. Godot puts it very well at the very end and uh, says, quote, you're like a drawn sword on the battlefield, one with countless nicks soaked in blood and rusting. 
a sword or um with a lethal crack in it a sword that's begun to break and it's it's the way of writing is so unique in a sense because it's just this old blacksmith who's just on his deathbed is comparing loss and hatred and like sorrow to a sword which isn't something you would really consider about comparing but you look at it and you kind of take the words and you kind of like take them a little less literally and then it starts to make a lot more sense and it it's just a really well crafted message that i just adore about this chapter and it shows a lot about guts as a character and it shows that he is very closed off and doesn't want to accept the truth even though it's basically breaking him um and others can see that even an old dying man so that is one of my favorite chapters um coming from conviction and then next is 287 a chapter that made me cry when i initially read it and still makes me tear up to this day looking through it like i can't go back to this chapter without like feeling very like heavy hearted um chapter 287 uh, bubbles of fu uh, futility it's the chapter where guts and gang have set sail Casca is on the front of the boat and guts is he he's kind of at his limit right now he starts to get blurried vision he's all tattered up he's like he's not in a very good state and guts or not uh guts uh shirke and farnese are flying around the boat um kind of observing everyone um roderick uh comes up to guts and just you know it's just two dudes having a friendly banter and everything and um roderick asks you know why why don't you stick closer to her isn't she at risk you know trying to run around the boat like that and guts just doesn't answer and then he goes tell me what just what exactly is she to you and then you know playfully asks is she your woman um and Casca then looks back at them and then kind of pouts and then looks away and guts says well she's my and then it gets cut off um by farnese waking back up and she's just kind of like starstruck by what he was about to say um mainly just because um she feels a bit of a connection to guts um some people would say that farnese kind of grows like a sort of love affection to her to him i can understand that but i don't think it goes to that extent um but then shirake also picks up on it uh and she's just kind of like a little bit upset by it as well um and then this the the chapter kind of like it, it's a pretty calm chapter so far and then it kind of starts ramping up as Casca is climbing onto the front of the ship and guts takes action tries to go after her and she she gets scared um uh and he tries to save her and then she just jumps off because you know she's she's practically a child right now and so she jumps off into the water and guts tries to save her but she slips out of his hand um because it's it's a metal arm um and guts still tattered up not in any position to do what he's about to do jumps overboard to save her and 
he starts reminiscing on, on how this has happened before, how she has fallen off into the water and he has had to save her. Um, he brings her back up and she gets saved, but then he gets drugged down by his metallic arm. And as he's slowly being drifted down into the ocean, he starts remembering all the, all the moments he's experienced with her um, by the water. And then it kind of goes into him then slowly reminiscing on the bittersweet and painful memories of distant days. And then it always goes back to um, the eclipse for him. And then afterwards, he finally wakes back up. And everyone's like worried about him. He's immediately just worried about Casca. Uh, and she's being treated by Farnese in, in the bathroom. And then he, after everyone else leaves and Shirke goes to redo the marking on his neck, um, he looks back at how she just slipped right through his hand and then looks at his stub on his arm and goes, I'd forgotten. It's just a lump of iron I've attached so I could beat up my enemies. She slipped right through. I guess even if you force back what was lost, it still won't be the way it was. And it's just a really emotional scene and gets me every time. Uh, you can kind of probably tell I'm, I'm choking up as I'm talking. <laughs> Um, it's it's just a really lovely scene, and it's um. God, I'm I'm having trouble concentrating. Sorry, um, bro. Good line too. Oh my god, very deep. It's very deep, deep. line. It's, it's one of those quotes that will definitely stick with me, and it's definitely one of those things that help me look at things differently. Um. And is one of the many, many uh, connections and moments that help strengthen the bond between a lot of the characters and is a very well-crafted chapter overall. Um, so it's, it's a really good chapter. And it's my absolute favorite out of the entire, entire series. Um, and it, it gets me every time. Um, next is the Casca, like, sort of dream sequence. Um, this one also hits pretty hard, um, just because of what they're all experiencing. Um, to keep it sort of brief, because it's, like, over the span of, like, six to seven chapters, um, Farnes and Shirke go into casca's mind to try and help her um and um they sort of get transported to this giant barren wasteland that's just covered by an eclipse um or as they put it a black sun um a lot of things aren't really detailed but it's just a barren wasteland with a with just a lot of dust and in the distance they see a dog covered in spikes and scratches uh with a collar around it dragging a um dragging a coffin and on the coffin is the um band of the hawk crest um and then it's revealed that the like clothing or the cloth that's around the field is actually a bunch of demons and they start attacking both the dog and the coffin um and the dog is doing everything in its power to like save the coffin and it's a really weird moment but then you see that the dog is missing an eye and it's also then missing a foot and uh, its wounds slowly heal. 
and they realize that it's guts in Casca's world. Um, and they then realize that the the coffin must be Casca's. They then open it up and see a tattered, broken doll that they then realize is Casca's, um, with a miniature Casca inside it, um, which is essentially a fragment of herself. Um, they then go through this wasteland and try to essentially save Casca, and they have to relive all of her memories with Guts, dating as early as back as to the Campfire of Dreams, where they're up on the hill talking about their dreams as they overlook all of the pretty lights in the Band of the Hawk. Um, and it's just all these really nice experiences. And as they go along, th uh, they realize that the dog is going through these memories to collect pieces for the doll to try and piece her back. Um, and so Shirake uh, uses her powers to fight off of the cloth monsters that are attacking um, so that they could progress. Um, uh, we see later on some more, uh, some more moments, uh, like Guts, uh, at the start before he gets recruited to the Band of the Hawk. Um, we see some of their fights against the other armies, um, and Casca's like point of view from it all. Um, we then see how she got recruited by Griffith. Um, and how she had to kill someone uh, if she wanted to live. And then we also see like the ballroom dance. Um, we see a lot of other experiences between Guts and Casca and how they've bonded. Um, and then we see the fight between Guts and Griffith um, where he leaves. And all of the emotions that she was feeling at that moment in time. And uh, we then see the waterfall scene where Guts saves her from falling off a waterfall. And then we see them embrace. And um, Farnese is kind of taken aback by it. Um, Shirake is uh, being uh blinded from the things that they are seeing um and then uh th they then realize that the feelings that they're feeling are also part of Casca's feelings and that the journey is not over just yet and they just essentially just start collecting a bunch of pieces that eventually reform the doll to an almost complete state um but they have to go a little bit further. And uh, before they get to the moment where they have to go confront the Eclipse, um, the little fragment of Casca goes, there's someone I want to see. Um, and it's her trying to basically say, I want to go see Guts. It's a very touching like little thing that... Um, can kind of be passed on if not paid attention to. Um, uh, the group then goes through another like forest of monsters that this is where we kind of see the, the dick monsters start to form. Um, and we just see Shirke using her powers to hold off the monsters. Um, as they get through. Um, and we just see a lot of. Weird things going on. And they eventually have to walk through a field of entrails. And. It's just a horrible. Horrible thing that they have to go through. And eventually. They get to the final fragment. Which is the. Um, 
which is the uh, um, demon child or Casca's child. Um, but before they finally encounter it, they get interrupted by a giant hawk, um, which comes down and tries to attack the coffin, um, which is obviously uh, her representation of Griffith and what he's done to her. Um, and so a lot more fighting happens. Um, uh, the the hood that Serpico wears comes in and also helps. Um, and then eventually, after a lot of brutal attacks, um, the coffin is almost like, essentially almost tattered up, and uh, the the guts dog is is like pretty much on the brink of death and then the cloth that was nearby turns into the berserker helmet and then turns dog into the berserker dog um <clears throat> which could also be symbolized as like the beast of darkness and it just starts cleaving through enemies left and right to protect the the casket or the coffin and eventually uh leads away the the falcon um Shirke's mistress comes in and saves everyone and then they eventually get to the fetus um being the final fragment after they unravel it they experience the horrifying eclipse from Casca's point of view and they are just overwhelmed by everything that has happened. And then we see a point of view of what Casca saw as Guts was pinned down by the Apostles and can faintly see Griffith over her. We then get this very beautiful two-pager of Casca's body being broken piece by piece into the doll that she then becomes inside that coffin from that day and her heart is covered in thorns um in like a latch ditch effort the hawk finally comes back to try and attack Casca's heart um but guts comes in and stops it um the doll then becomes whole again and the nightmare is over Everything goes back to normal, and then we go back to the real world where Casca then wakes up and is back to her normal self. It's a very vivid, highly detailed, highly disturbing, and a, like a roller coaster of emotions. It's, a, it's just such an engrossing chapter. I've probably spent way too much a uh, ser series of chapters. I've probably spent way too much time talking about it. Uh, and just explaining what happened. Basically, recap the entire chapter. I I, I basically <laughs> recapped it, but like, I kind of needed to to talk about why I like it, and it's just the fact that it's another one of those moments where we see the previous encounters, but we see it from another point of view, and we don't really see that too often. Mainly, we just see Guts's point of view from a lot of things, and to see all of these very iconic moments and all of these things that have happened throughout the story like from a different view even though it's Casca's view and she was pretty much there in the same moment as Guts she experienced things a lot differently than he did and it just adds to both Casca and Guts as characters and it's one of those things that it's it's just like so it's not enjoyable to go back through and see it's really not you see everything and how Casca has been dealing with herself and her state of mind throughout the past two three years at this point in the story and it's just not a very pleasant thing to see 
but at the same point you see that she still cares and she still wants to see guts again and even though on the outside her body doesn't allow her to express it she really wants to show appreciation for not only what he's been doing but for everything that everyone else has been doing and you kind of see that leading up to everything that's broken her and when it's finally all over it's a very nice reunion to see her back um uh and i don't really know how else to put in the words just how beautiful everything is portrayed and just how good of a series of chapters it is it's just a really good set of chapters and it's it's hard to put in the words why it's like probably one of the best sequences in the story in my in my opinion um i think we both agree with you uh and then to finally sort of cap it off um i could have included it with the next or with the previous segment but uh i kind of felt like it deserved its own sort of thing it's chapter 355 the chapter literally right after she wakes up um where everyone's congratulating her on coming back um and how she knows everyone and you know everyone thought like oh she's just back she's not going to know anything but she she specifically thanks Farni Shirke uh Eva Lara she specifically thanks everyone and says it's good to meet you thank you for caring taking care of me as Elaine for so long um and everyone's just so happy and Shirke sort of realizes now that Casca's back in her true self um that like she is a completely different woman than what they previously thought previously thought and she's so much stronger than what they originally thought um and she she just goes into detail about how she was basically just watching everything through a very tight lens and it was like she was watching a dream where she was just sort of a spectator in it all in a distant darkness and she didn't have any actual input but Casca was there the entire time um it's just so nice and then uh Farnese goes um do you remember guts and that's where um one of my favorite panels 355 page eight it's it's the close-up of her crying it's just so nice um it's just so nice to see her like finally getting something out of her after so much has happened with the group um she then gets this really nice dress and is basically go told to reunite with one who is dear. Um, and we get this very beautiful two pager of Casca in this very nice elven dress. Um, and she starts reminiscing on everything that she's been through. Um, and she's just thinking of all the good and bad days with guts and then starts thinking about all of the time that she spent with not only guts but everyone else and then it's the field where she goes to meet guts and they start walking towards each other and then right before she could say his name she gets hit with all the trauma as she's looking him like straight on you can't see Guts's face at all. You can see like a vague jawline, 
but his face is shrouded in darkness and all you see behind him is the remnants of the eclipse and then what griffith's body was before he turned into femto and then she collapses from trauma it's a very bittersweet chapter and it's it's just very touching to say the least um 355 on the sun dapled ground it's a very nice chapter and it really did take me by surprise because i kind of assumed that after all of this it would all be fine but i didn't necessarily expect her to then collapse from the trauma and to not be able to see him again um but at the same point it was kind of expected just because nothing ever really goes uh how guts wants it to but at least she's back and i think that's all that really matters to him um so it's a very nice chapter and it's one of the very good chapters that end off the series um so yeah that's pretty much all i have to say about my favorite chapters i've been talking for way too long <laughs> um i'm very sorry about that it's all right uh, that's how it is that's pretty much we all like I have berserk. To say for my, yeah that's pretty much all i have to say about my favorite chapters unless you guys have anything else before we move into our last section like small little things we're gonna talk about the last chapter and then we'll be done yeah uh, one last thing just to this is a little section to briefly mention any things we forgot which i forgot uh i think i said roderick at the beginning but it's roderick so i fuck me. <laughs> i pronounce it roderick it, it, it's a lot, spelled some roderick people say, yeah some people say roderick uh some people say roderick I think it's pronounced Roderick. Um, that's how I've heard other people pronounce it. But for all I know, I could be saying it wrong. I was pronouncing Shirke wrong the entire time before. Uh, I was calling your Shirk. Um, Shirk. But it's pronounced Shirke. Um, so who knows? I could be pronouncing it wrong. But who knows? It's it's whatever. Another cool moment I would like to touch on is. I think now that I think back on it, it might be my, like my favorite moment away from the main cast, you could say, or like Guts's gang, uh, is Rickert confronting Griffith and Falconia. Yes. That is yes. a really the cool moment, and I really like that moment. The fucking slap. <laughs> I was, yep. I was, my brain was like, uh, after we we went back on it. I was like, oh, that, I should have said that in favorite fights. That would have been funny. <laughs> but we were already past it. Um, but yeah, yeah that's, Rickert, a, that's a very good scene. Rickert confronting Guts is a, is a really good scene. And I would have really liked to see uh, where Rickert and the one guy's name, I can't remember, the Kushan dude. Silent. And, yeah, and where they go on their, uh, yeah. their, their quest. Uh, any other last minute interjections before we move on to the final chapter? I've pretty much said all that can be said for right now. Yeah, it just about covers it. Well, then why don't right. we talk about chapter 364? Um, so 364, while... It can be unsatisfactory, or it it's not what everyone wanted. Um, I feel like a lot of people wanted a bit more from it. Um, considering that it could very well be the last chapter in the series, we're still in a sort of limbo on if the series is going to continue or not. To my knowledge, we haven't had an official statement as of October 23rd, 2021. Um, on if the series is going to continue or not. Um, but that being said, 
if the series does not continue, I think that 364 is the perfect ending that it could have had. I personally believe that while, yeah, it's a bit sad to see that we'll never get answers on a lot of things and we'll probably also never see the final battles between Guts and Griffith and how that was resolved, it's still one of those things where it's like, you know, I'm satisfied. I'm I'm glad it ended this way. Um, with the way that the chapters portrayed where Moonlight Child has finally come to the island um, after being teased at the end of 363, um, we kind of see that, you know, he's interacting with everyone and everyone's kind of surprised to see him uh, show up. Uh, we finally get to see fully awake Casca interacting with the Moonlight Child and see how much they like bond. Um, and then eventually we see just a bunch of little funny moments between um, the group and Moonlight Child. And then eventually um, near the end, uh, we see um griffith transforming from the moonlight child and he says i had a dream under the full moon i was a child embraced by a nostalgic warmth but when i wake from the dream only a vague sense of longing remains that too will soon disappear with a single tear like morning dew it is a very bittersweet end to a very well-written, long-running story. I am going to have a lot of trouble putting this in the words, mainly just because my brain is fried. Um, I've been going for like three hours at this point. Yeah, um, but I, I just feel like at this point, it's it's kind of like oh this is really like tearing at me because i i know what i want to say i just don't know how i want to say it it's not exactly going out with a bang but from my point of view at least this chapter really like has a good summary of a lot of things that have happened uh, like where we have come from Showing, you know, the Magic City, you know, where Farnese, Serpico, Shirke, and of course now Casca are at this point. Um, and the character that of course we see the most is Guts. There's that scene where he comes into the house with the Moonlight Child and he tells he tells them, take the child to her. Mm -hmm. That is the polar opposite of the guts we see in Black Swordsman. Yeah. It literally shows you just how far we have come. And the scene, the scene that made, made me cry was when he's swinging his sword around by, by the waterfall. And then, you know, it's, it, it's a, it's a throwback. He's by the, he's by the waterfall again. And then the, the child comes up and, and gets in his armor and they have the little sword battle. It was so yeah. adorable and so sad. I love that scene so much. You guts wouldn't have done something like that 300 chapters ago. It's just, it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, it's a satisfying ending, but I know that in the rest of the story, Guts is still kind of continuing on. But at that point, it's a satisfying ending where I can continue sort of my journey. You know, I've I've come with them through the course of the past 364 chapters. I've been with these characters for so long. 
where I can take the messages and I can take the things that they've been through and change my outlook on life and sort of go, you know, I, I know he's still out there. I know Guts is still out there struggling like I am. Um, and he's still going and so am I. You know, even though this is the end of the story, it's still not really the end, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, it's a great way of putting it. Fantastic. Fantastic way um, of putting it. This I this person um wrote a message. I don't I don't know who specifically wrote this because it's anonymous. Um, but they kind of put a general gist of the series as a whole now that it's ended um, into what I'm kind of trying to say. And it goes like this. Um, I hope we take to heart the message Miura tried to share. The world is often unfair and cruel. It will traumatize you at best and leave you maimed at worst. Nothing will make it, quote, just like it was before you got hurt. Sure, being angry at shit can be a great motivator, but it only gets you so far. All, all you can do is keep moving forward, scars and all. Work to be the best version of yourself and try to live a good life. Look after the people you have, even though you will lose some along the way. You can always make new connections if you're willing to let people in. It's, it's one of those really touching stories that while having a bittersweet ending it's one of those things that will stick with you for the rest of your life at least for me at least um and just as this person put i i definitely see life in the new light i definitely don't see everyday life as now just like this boring trek I now sort of just see it as, yeah, today sucks, but I'm going to just keep pushing to tomorrow because tomorrow might have something better for me. Sure, I might have something shitty happen to me today, but that doesn't mean something shitty is going to happen tomorrow. So just fight through it. Um. Berserk as a whole, I, I said I said before, it's it's really it really has changed a lot of things about the way I look at life and the way I experience things. Um and truly, I I truly do think if I had it if I had read it like years ago. I would probably be a not no completely different person, but I probably wouldn't have gone through a lot of the things I would have gone through just because of the messages and the things that have happened in the story that I took out of it and have started applying to my life. It is such a touching story with well-crafted characters and I couldn't have asked for a better ending and with us knowing that Mira didn't fully finish the chapter at least if i'm remembering correctly it was his editors that finished the chapter a lot of the later pages look like Mira's artwork but if going off of information given to us by both young animal and some close friends of Mira. Um, it's more than likely that his editors were the one that finished off the chapter. And if they are able to finish the story, that's great. You know, more power to them. I would, like, if they feel like they can do it, then they should do it. Um, but... You know, I'm not saying that they need to. If this is how Berserk ends, it's an amazing send-off. And will forever be ingrained 
in history as one of the best pieces of media in my personal opinion that I've ever that has ever been written um I know that sounds like a very bold statement and it's probably filled with a lot of bias. <laughs> but I have been truly and deeply touched by the story and the characters and everything as a whole. And through all the other pieces of media and works of literature that I've experienced, nothing has come close to Berserk. And I truly and do like truly and deeply think that everyone needs to experience it. Um, even if it is unfinished. I think he speaks for the three of us here. I don't know if I can even attempt to add anything onto that. Noah, do you have anything to say? I mean, you, you again, you covered most of it. Um, <laughs> but backpacking on what you said earlier, yeah, it with most stories, you don't want them to end, and this is definitely one of the ones where you really didn't want it to end. Uh, but it, the ending was both like a satisfactory ending and also a kind of annoying one because they were also setting up they were also setting up to go somewhere pretty deep with it and they asked a lot of questions with the with the final chapter especially with the final page mm -hmm. um but with that being said if they do continue to go on like the, it is both a good ending and a perfect starting point to finish uh berserk and even if even if they do continue it, the like the final five or so pages that were that was done by his uh, editing team, yeah, you can notice a different in, difference in the art. His hair looks flatter. Things are a little bolder, but that honestly, that's really about it. Mm -hmm. It still looks like Mira's work. So they they've done a or. Like everyone involved has done a perfect job at both ending it and setting it up to continue if they decide to do that. Right. Yeah, very well put. If this isn't the ending and there's more, awesome. I'm all for it. I'm absolutely going to keep reading it. And if it is the ending, that is okay. So you remember earlier how we were joking? About how we were just gonna like do five of these episodes and say the same thing. Yeah, we've already started doing that with the with the end already. <laughs> <laughs> we all wanna get it off our chest. Yeah, that's what this episode is for. It's it Very it nice. may be a bit of a ramble episode, but it's our it's our berserk appreciation, and I feel like you know now was. A better time than ever it's been a it's been a hard year for berserk fans um no and i got into berserk this year it's it's fucking amazing what this story has done for individuals uh creators people making media nowadays mm -hmm. there were a lot of it youtube shaped. channels that started up because of Mira's death, and like you look up like Mira, uh, like honoring Mira, you'll find videos of like Final Fantasy, Dark Souls, Monster Hunter, yeah, all all things which he influenced with his work. Um, there's people like making special design gunplas where they take parts from others, they custom paint them, they put it together, and they make the Black Swordsman, and they do all this stuff. And then there's people like doing retrospectives of Berserk, um, reviews of Berserk, all this stuff, purely because of his death. And after he died, it really showed how much of an impact that it had on so many pieces of media. Mm. With how many people came out and were like, yeah, this, this heavily influenced 
our creative process for this game or this show or whatever, and we're deeply saddened by his passing. And it also got to show that a lot of people who didn't even really know about Berserk when Mir's death was announced and everyone started talking about it, a lot of people from the outside came in and were like, oh, this guy had a lot of inf uh or like this this guy's work influenced and created a lot of things that i like and so i don't i don't know about this series and i don't know who this guy is but i just wanted to say i i sincerely thank him for the work that he has done because it has made something that i truly and deeply care about and that's really cool that people who don't even know about the series were able to still appreciate the things that he's done because his work has influenced and had an impact on so many other things that are popular nowadays. It It's just, it's crazy to think that a, pe a single piece of work that started in 89, this cruel, dark fantasy manga that was started by a guy who had the idea since he was in high school. It's crazy to think that it would go on to not only like popularize dark fantasy in Japan, but also create a bunch of like protagonist stereotypes and a lot of things that would go on to be popularized by other pieces of media and be a general theme across certain characters like the whole metal arm and like either eye patch or missing eye thing or like a character who is pretty pretty bulky but not like over the top bulky and then wielding a giant sword or just the giant sword trope in general also just you know anti-hero archetype as a whole you could argue that too that was it's... also another thing when i was yeah. playing metal gear solid 5 phantom pain uh, Venom Snake in that game is missing his right eye and his left arm, and I yeah, I blew Maddox's mind because he was showing me uh more panels from Berserk at that point, and then that was like shortly after that is when I started reading it in February, and I blew his mind. I'm like, oh, he's just like Snake, and he's like, what? I'm like, well, <laughs> look up, yeah, look up, uh, look up, punished Venom Snake, and he looks up, he's like. Dude, oh my gosh, it's a Berserk reference. I'm like, <laughs> he's been saying that a lot. Everything is a Berserk reference. If yes. we're being honest, I Life like, we make is a this joke reference. all the time. <laughs> if we're being honest, it is. Because there was no dark fantasy, like major dark fantasy story out at that time. There wasn't. There was really only fantasy, and it was kind of that weird cartoonish stuff. Yeah, that, that goofy shit. Yeah. <laughs> this is like Lord of the Rings. That was it. And oh, you know, completely yeah. off the walls goofy. Pants on the head crazy. <laughs> well, and and the thing is too, it was like also specifically in Japan, there like while there wasn't much fantasy, there also wasn't like any dark fantasy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's like this really niche thing that eventually just become that just became so popularized. Um even though like Maybe the dark fantasy genre as a whole wasn't popularized, but like a lot of things taken out of Berserk and the genre itself was then put into other pieces of media. And then that sort of popularized a lot of other things and everything just kind of grew as a whole. This series is a spectacle. It's amazing to see what it's done for individuals and the world. Yes. Any, any last dying things y'all want to say um again i'm gonna reiterate and state it again read berserk if you made if it you to this point why yeah if you what did you do and you haven't read berserk why did you if, do this to yourself if you thank you but why point, yes if, if you made it to this point and you haven't read it go read it right now yeah read it anyway we don't care and if what we have talked about and what we have like gushed over and like fawned over 
hasn't gotten you interested, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> I like, yeah, I, like, no true, offense, like truly. But come on. My offer still stands. I'll, I'll come down there and I'll read it to you, bro. Yeah, for, for, <laughs> for free. That no lie, that's a generous offer coming from him. You should take him up on that offer. Yeah, I ask money for everything. <laughs> hey, man, we're going to go see a movie. You want to come? Yeah, how much are you going to pay me to come see this movie? I don't know if you heard him <laughs> earlier, but he asked for a paycheck for doing this. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. How many episodes have I been in now? What What am I getting out of this? Nothing. That's not I was true. The majority don't of this say episode, that. I get the bigger paycheck. <laughs> no, if anything, yeah, more get lines, he gets the bigger <laughs> check. The series is great. This? Closing statements. The series is great. If you haven't read it, what the fuck are you doing? Go do go do yourself a favor. Read it right now, and then come back and tell us how correct we were on how good it is. <laughs> yes, um, inflate my ego, please. Um, and to close it off, the series is amazing. It's impacted my myself and a lot of other people. I highly recommend it, and. Um, fight me, nerds. Lost Children is better than a lot of other <laughs> arts. <laughs> of course, that's how he ends it. Uh, we keep that in. <laughs> we like to have fun. Thanks for watching <laughs> this episode. Love you. I'll make sure to shut up next time. <laughs>